need to negotiate with TransLink on their ticketing systems with the aim to allow other routes that enter and depart the Noosa Shire to be included, and D, advocate to the State Government of Queensland Minister for Transport that Noosa Shire Council local government area is a future trial site for fully subsidised public transport. Mr Chair, can we just get subsidised correctly spelt there? Subsided means it's going to fall apart. That's subsidised. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and if we're playing around with words, should it be as a future trial site rather than is a future trial site? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Brian. So after government area as a future trial site or, or a fully subsidised as a future trial site. I'm going to start with um, some interesting facts that we provided quite recently um, from our Go Noosa transport officers in a workshop to all the councillors. Um, Noosa has approximately 20,000 workers. <coughs> of the 20,000 workers a day, only 183 use public transport every day to get to work. Um, the numbers given to us that workshop also told us that there are approximately 13,500 cars on the road each and every day driven by our residents to get to work. Um, so add to this number, cars on the road used to transport 8,284 school kids to and fro work. Um, do the numbers, you see we've got a problem. The amendment that I've put together simply requests radical action because radical action is the only way we will see radical behaviour change. Zero fare policy or free buses, it's not a new idea. There is already 100 cities across the world in US, Europe, Korea, Taiwan that have made public transport free. Like Noosa, these cities are tackling the same issues of traffic, congestion, clearing air and keeping climate targets on track. What they've found and what we already know through our free weekend bus trial is that free buses is not a silver bullet and to maximise its impact, it needs to be part of a broader policy mix that rewards public transport use and disincentivises car use. And it also needs to be part of a broader transport strategy that includes infrastructural changes such as priority bus lanes and paid parking. The amendment in front of us requests that we write to the Queensland Minister for Transport and request that Noosa is considered as a future trial for fully subsidised public transport. We are Queensland's first council to trial the initiative of free buses every weekend. So let's extend that initiative to every day to take our workers and school kids and our visitors out of cars and on public transport. And further, let's request that the trial be fully subsidised by the state and request that the state make good <coughs> of their promise to back action on climate change. The data from the trial would provide in my opinion, insightful and useful resident trends and visitor trends that would feed into a broader transport strat strategy for both the state and Noosa. I ask that you support the amendment in front of you. Just another wording, um, I think it doesn't, to my way of reading, it doesn't seem to make sense, I think. Advocate the State Government of Queensland, Minister for Transport, that Noosa Shire Council Local Government area mm -hmm. be considered as a future trial site for fully subsidised public transport? Do we need the words be considered yeah. in there? Yeah, that yeah. was rushed. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm happy to take some of the approval of the committee. Yeah, is everyone else yeah, happy with that? Yeah, I don't know if that just for a chat. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying that. Yeah. 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 the intention of the movement. Okay. Councillors. I'm happy to talk to him. Yeah, sure. And I will reiterate that it's not an amendment, it's the motion before us in yes. whole, just to clarify that. Uh, and with, a point, with point D added from this uh, recommendation as uh, the motion moved by the council. Um, yeah, so that um, 
I've always been one to uh, fully to advocate for subsidise or, or, or free public uh, public transport. I think our trials are showing how well it works, particularly during those holiday periods and now in weekend periods. The opportunities that it presents for uh, not only the tourists and trying to discourage them from taking their vehicles uh, to uh, to the uh, high tourism areas, but also for locals the opportunity to get around the, the area free, for uh, kids and the like to uh, uh, unburden mum and dad to some degree to uh, allow them uh, that freedom that uh, not they're not chattel to, uh, to a motor vehicle and uh, as we used to when we were kids, um, getting around and, uh, and using buses and the like. Free public transport uh, could be subsidised by a reduction in the need to continually uh, maintain uh, or upgrade the road system to cater for more and more vehicles. If we had a good, well-facilitated public transport system in Queensland, which I believe is one of the, uh, the, the lesser public transport systems in this country, particularly in the, uh, in the, in the CBD areas and, uh, and, and the regional connections that go with it, I believe that uh, public transport would be more fully utilised and, uh, and I'd advocate that in any way, shape or form. What we have before us uh, from the staff recommendation is the success of the free weekend bus services and I believe that, uh, that we should continue these free weekend bus services. They're proving to be popular, they're proving to be successful. Uh, the challenge for us in the future will be how we continue to fund them. I'm happy to speak to it. Thank you, <coughs> Mr Chair. Um, I'm happy to support the staff recommendation of the increase in the free weekend bus trial extension. Um, the uptake has been excellent. We saw it from our reports 50%. Similarly, the feedback was excellent. 94% of respondents very satisfied with the service and 6% satisfied. So that's 100% satisfied, satisfied across the board. Um, and 100% of people would recommend free buses, weekend buses to others. The feedback from our hinterland was incredibly positive as well. So it's, it's clear that this uh, has support from right across the Shire. The Pomona and District Chamber of Commerce indicated that the free weekend buses trial was helping to counter socialised isolation with seniors using the free weekend bus service <coughs> to access Noosa Civic and Noosa Junction Cinema. And it's also been popular with young people in the hinterland facilitating access to attractions on the coast. As well as this, the free weekend buses have also encouraged travel into the hinterland, including Pomona markets and access to hiking trails. Hastings Street indicated the same positive support with one business owner stating, there are so many positive to, positives to this continuing and that it's for everyone, all ages, locals, tourists, staff and day trippers. 30 to 60 people on a bus conservatively reduces 20 vehicles a day in a precinct or shire and so it's good for the environment. That was some of the feedback. So it's clear that this is very popular and I'm, I'm really supportive of it extending. I'm also supportive of advocating to the state government and Councillor Lawrenston's um, initiative to uh, Noosa be considered as a future trial site for fully subsidised public transport. Uh, the answer is always no, unless you ask. So it doesn't hurt to ask, and I'm certainly happy to um, advocate to the minister on, in that regard as well. So fully supportive of this um, recommendation. Thank you. Uh, question to staff. Is it true that... Um the state is already paying close attention to the work being done by Nursing Council in regards to free public transport. I'd have to take that on notice, and that's my you, that's my that's my understanding, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, oh, thank you. Right. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, it's great. Anything to um, you know look at this reduction in congestion congestion and um, you know, providing equity across the Shire for free movement. Um, I'm just wondering, is this a good opportunity to find out where we sit, and this may maybe a question through the Chair's CEO, around Council's own policy in um, looking at how we can be leaders in getting our own staff to work using public transport or other means? Where are we at with that? Um. Through the chair in response to Councillor Pinsall, um, that would be something that we'd enshrine in the certified agreement. It's currently not within uh, the certified agreement. Negotiations around that will start in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I've worked in previous councils where um, there is um, subsidised carpooling with specific car parking arrangements. There's the ability to be able to subsidise fully or partly public transport to work for, for council officers. 
Um, but ultimately that needs to be fully costed as to what the impact would be overall, um, but that would be provided as a benefit to the employee's um, employment with council. Um, the starting point is the certified agreement and then you could extend <coughs> that further into the, the managerial roles that are on contract. But uh, um, yeah, there are opportunities to do that. The certified agreement is, is the best way to go ahead with that and that um, everybody agrees that that is a benefit. Um, it can also be simply dealt with via policy, uh, but I prefer to be able to follow a clear process and that we have had union consultation and that expectations are known and that um, I, I wouldn't mandate that staff have to use a particular form of transport. Um, everybody has different needs and requirements, mm. but if we can do our bit in subsidising or providing carpooling options, making it easier, more than happy to be able to look at that as we go through that process in the future. Mm, thank you. I think that'd be fantastic. <coughs> if we're reaching out to state to, um, you know, look at us as a trial site, it'd be really good to say that we can match that with what we're doing mm. in our in our own backyard. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh yeah. So I was thinking about this over the weekend uh, when uh, Councillor Lawrence indicated that she was going to add D, and it occurred to me that we probably had a. Um, been strategically remiss in our free bus scheme because everyone calls it the Noosa Council free bus scheme but probably the highest level of subsidy for those free bus comes from the Queensland Government that not only do public transport across the whole state get a high level of subsidy but the deals that they offer us to offer free bus is also quite an attractive deal it's not full cost and therefore, I'm going to move a slight amendment. And that is, in D, to start with thank the State Government of Queensland Minister for Transport. So take out the words advocate to. So if you just copy D, it's largely going to be the same. So instead of advocate to, just put thank. And after the words Queensland Minister for Transport, so thank the Queensland, the State Government of Queensland Minister for Transport for his government's ongoing support of subsidised public transport. And advocate that. And that's my amendment. Right, now we have a seconder to that, please. Yeah, I'll see. Seconder, Joan Jerusalem. I do so. Um, I think it is important to understand that we are um, working with the state government. We'd like to go faster than Translink, but we're one small shy. So, Fully subsidised public transport is probably a fairly big ask if it sets a precedent for the state. I actually think um, fully subsidised transport with where there's a local participation or funding, perhaps funded from um, paid car parking by tourists or congestion taxation or whatever. I think we first have to recognise that we're in partnership in delivering this free bus service and rather than just keeping on our saying this is what we want, this is what we want. We have to say, thanks for coming on the ride with us. Pun not intended. <laughs> the, it, it really really is. Um, we, In all the meetings I'm aware of, the political support has been there for the sustainable transport initiatives we've put in. I think what Council Lawrence is suggesting is a good next step. <coughs> Can I request just a change in wording? <coughs> Um, instead of thank the state government, acknowledge. So it's an acknowledge and advocate. Um, that's just a, a preferred wording if Brian Councillor Stockwell no, is happy with that. Okay. <laughs> that's all right. I wish to speak to the amendment. Just a, a, a question. Yeah. To the CEO. And is it mean these amendments? Are, are nice, but is it what you already do anyway? 
or would, wouldn't you be doing this as a matter of course, as a good business, anyway? Um, through, through the chair council, we're gonna, um, absolutely, but it's delivered at an officer to officer level with the state government. Uh, so our advocacy, our acknowledgement, our thanks, the relationships that we have with TransLink, Transport and Main Roads, at an officer level is, is very sound. It's, it's quite solid and we, we have that mutual respect. Um, as amendments and a resolution of the council coming from the council table, um, it then takes that um, to that next level and gives it the ability for this council to communicate directly with the minister um, and gets that on the minister's um, priority list and, uh, and understanding that correspondence has been resolved upon by this council table. It's going to the minister and the minister can understand how important it is for Noosa Shire. Um, when we advocate, I'd advocate from a CEO level to the Director General of Transport um, or the General Manager of TransLink, uh, but it would stay at those levels within Transport and Main Roads and very rarely get up into the political space. Um, this provides that extra level of gravitas to what Council's wanting to achieve and um, a really great way of communicating at a ministerial level. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just on this point, the question of subsidies being Raise. I believe I heard in previous discussions that TransLink subsidise public transport. It's either on the Sunshine Coast or Noosa to the tune of $11 million a year. Are you able to clarify whether it's that $11 million is the subsidy given to Noosa, the Noosa network alone or whether it's the Sunshine Coast or I, I, I can't answer that question. I'd have to take that on notice. Apologies. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll um, speak in support of the, the amendment because it does acknowledge the, the heavy subsidies that are in play already and it, it makes it clear that public transport um, free initiatives aren't really free, someone pays, whether it's through a sustainable transport levy, uh, on top of the heavy subsidies that the state government already provide and that um, also that Noosa, Noosa the Noosa Shire Council local government area is already considered a trial site um, per se. Um, my understanding is TransLink staff working very closely with the Noosa Council staff are watching very closely the way um, public, uh, subsidised public transport plays out here and the results that it delivers in terms of passenger numbers, who the passengers are and the numbers of cars that would otherwise be on the road. And if I had to bet on it, um, this, as, as the Mayor said, there's no harm in asking. Um, that's what good advocates do for fully subsidised um, public transport in the area, local government area. But if I had to bet on it, I would say that um, given that Noosa Council is already offering free public transport uh, the full year, <coughs> every weekend, as well as the major holidays, Christmas and Easter, that we would, and we're considering other ways to provide, extend um, the free public transport network in Noosa by paid parking for visitors as suggested, that we may even be able to fully subsidise public transport in Noosa ourselves before the state would come on board with something like that, but as I said, it's no harm in asking. And that the state, regardless of who funds it, would be considering looking at Noosa very closely as a, a trial site for fully pub subsidised public transport regardless of who funds. So I, I support the Amendment because it does acknowledge the heavy subsidies that the state government already provide. Anyone else wish to speak to Councillor Stockwell's amendment? Yeah, Robert. John? Um, I'll reiterate all those those points made, uh, and particularly Brian's point about uh, the fact that public transport is heavily subsidised by the by the state government and uh, and the ongoing support of uh, of uh, the TransLink and. Uh, and the department in uh, in allowing us to uh, to have those uh, free weekend buses and those free holiday buses for uh, uh, for those that use the service. Of course, nothing's free; it's all paid for by somebody somewhere. And the concept of a uh, of a future trial site for fully subsidised public transport may be the catalyst for a formula by which all of Queensland can uh, can come up with a system of uh, of uh, fully free use public transport for everybody. Councillor Stockwell, you used to close? Okay, put the amendment of those in favour. Uh, that's unanimous. 
we now go back to the original motion, uh, to which uh, one, two, everyone has spoken to, except for Councillor Wegener and myself. Councillor Wegener, you wish to speak to the original motion? <coughs> I was just down at Hastings Street and watched uh, so many happy people get off the free buses. I was so impressed. It's just working a treat. And to think that you know, two or three of those people represent a car not coming in is phenomenal. So yeah, congratulations. It's a marvelous thing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just like to say that this um, motion uh, really is about the success of the free weekend bus trial. And it's a, a compliment to staff mm. who've been driving this process. Um, as the mayor said, there's been very, very good feedback from people across the Shire, especially the hinterland, provides access for them out there as well, and um, really uh, encouraged by the feedback and looking forward to expanding the program in the future. Um, Councillor Lawson, um, I will just add, which I didn't add in my, um, when I made the motion, um, I, I referenced school kids, our workers, um, to reference our domestic visitors, 1.2 million of them every year. And I also didn't reference our most vulnerable. Um, the, in the United States, one of the reasons that they're introducing in places like Washington and through legislation, um, free public transport for tra ferries, trains and buses, um, is to address the issue of homelessness and to allow um, equity um, for those that live on the streets um, that need access to services. So I would just like to um, include that as part of my reasons for wanting to advocate to the state and thank the state, agree with you, um, Brian, um, that there is um, a need um, for public transport um, beyond just our visitors, um, our workers, our school kids. Um, it's also an issue of social equity. Thank you. Put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Larry. Thank, Thank you, Gray. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Gray. Thank Next item is the contract award for Microsoft Enterprise Agreement Software Licensing. Uh, welcome, Justin. And uh, there's a new uh, recommended recommendation, please. Linda, if you could bring that up. Okay, uh, Trent or Justin, you wish to talk us through what we're looking at and any changes since this last came from before the council, please. Thank you. So I came last week to have approval for the Microsoft licensing procurement. I need to tell you I've just been advised there was an error with the quotation. Uh, we have resolved that with Microsoft and Data3. They resubmitted the quotation. And we also had to include 20 new licenses for Microsoft project management software for infrastructure services. So the new figure is $3,389.79 higher than the one I gave you last week because of those extra Microsoft licenses. The original problem was resolved with a $40.05 decrease in the uh, original quote, but because we've added that project licensing, it's now $3,389 higher. Okay. Question for the CEO. CEO, given that uh, these figures have changed and they're not actually documented in um, recommendations in any way, shape or form, how will we, apart from clarifying the amount here in either in a recommendation or in other, some other way, shape or form, how will we um, record those changes so the public are aware of what those figures are. Um, to the Chair, Councillor Jurisovich, uh, we, we could look at a, an, um, an amendment and officers might be able to offer what an amendment may, may look like to the Council table to ensure that that transparency is there. So we could uh, very briefly provide some advice to you on that. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's appropriate. Um, that. Um, while we do have a report before you, there has been some work that's occurred between um, the Services and Organisation Committee and this General Committee today, which is where we have a revised uh, recommendation from Council officers for the Council. But 
Um, if we I'm suggesting, do we, add a, do we add a C here with the uh, correct clarification of I, the... I think that would, that would be fine. And while it's, it hasn't been moved and seconded, we may seek an administrative, through the chair, maybe an administrative change now at the table, if you like. Perhaps um, authorise the CEO to negotiate the final annual fees and schedule of rates with data three and, and provide these to the ordinary meeting. Oh, just, just through the chair, just a, just another point of clarification, if you understand. Um, this isn't a fixed fee contract. Um, obviously, the number of staff we have in the organisation um, <coughs> can change the fee because obviously more staff means more licences. Mm. Also, as we move through the three-year term of this licence, mm. we might take on more niche or specialised software um, offerings from Microsoft. An example is the, the amendment that, that Justin alluded to, which is Microsoft Project. So, if the infrastructure team um, further progress using a, a product like project for their project management, we'll need more licenses. Um, so that we can provide a revised fee, which is based on in in the most in the recommendation based on today's licensing and user requirements. Um, and then obviously note as I, as we did suggest in beta, the schedule of rates is what um, will determine. Um, Do you have any No. Um, that means the original recommendation with fixed figures in there is not actually correct with regard to what the cost of this will be. It will be based on the licences. So I think we need to look at the wording of the recommendation to actually reflect the methodology in which this is calculated. It, the, the, the figures quoted gave three... Uh, a three-year term of 1.6 million, which could vary. Um, I understand that varies, but it, it, it suggests that it's a fixed price contract in the recommendation by the figures that are quoted. I think there needs to be some rewording of the recommendation. Oh, it's been just be referred to ordinary. Yeah, if we could look at the wording of that and refer it. I, I, I'd ask, yeah, my, rec my, my, my motion here would be to refer this to, uh, to the ordinary meeting uh, to give staff a chance to re-look at the wording to clarify that it's not a fixed Fixed price contract that is a variable contract based on licenses. So yeah, yeah I, I believe staff seen. did uh, circulate an alternative recommendation which is in front of us that does not um, include the fees that Councillor Jurusovic is concerned about. It appears to me that that would cover those concerns if we adopt the what's put up there as committee recommendation. Is that right? I think Joe's saying something different. Well, I'm saying no, the, no, original, no. the original recommendation... It's very different to the original recommendation. It is very different to the original recommendation. The original recommendation actually had the figures quoted. This recommendation doesn't. Yeah. I think the disparity between the two needs to be a little more clearly yeah. reiterated. I'm not happy with this recommendation. I think we need to bring in what the, the figures are on a... You know, a we'll that it's not a fixed price contract. It's based on user licences and the like. Refer to the matter to the ordinary meeting of council. So it's seconded council stock off. Can I just ask a question? Yes, what's the uh, actual quantum we're, we're looking at here, Mr. CEO? Like the quant what's the, the, the what's the discrepancy? Through the chair, uh, three thousand three hundred dollars. Okay, and so annually. we're moving this on on three thousand three hundred dollars. That's that's what we're moving. No, that's no, not no, that's no, not no, correct. No, no, no Madam Mayor, I think um, through through the chair, uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Jurista, which is concerned, is that on further advice from council officers. Um, that is, um, can be some sort of some somewhat a fighting contract, yeah, sure. um, depending on licences and um, headcount, um, the types of um, products yeah, sure. that we take on board within that licence. Um, what we'll do is um, with the, the mover in the second, and now having this motion on the floor to refer to ordinary, we'll make that a little bit more clear for the yeah. council, so that we have some um, advice as to what the quantum we believe is now, and potentially if there is some further impact, what that may look like. And what, what may cause that variation, i.e. additional life, this is based on this many licences or whatever. You know, the, I, mean, I guess the, the question is, what choice do we have? I mean, we don't, it's just a matter of getting the wording right so that it's understood not only by ourselves, but also by the public as to the costs associated with this going forward, and that it's not a fixed rate, schedule of rate, it's actually a variable schedule of rates. Joan, want to take that as your, your talk my, my, my communication too, yeah. Okay. Yeah, can I, can I just yeah, add to that? Question. On page 16 of the um, Service and Organisation Committee, um, is that enough information? That looks like it does. It says if additional users are employed mm. during the term of the agreement, individual licences for those users are added from that year. 
So I guess we just need to clarify where do you show us, where does that show up in our budget or where we love it? That, that would be it through the chair, that would be updated through our annual budget deliberations yeah. um, using our built and base approach with our budget uh, where we do adjust uh, volumes and pricing um, for all of our contracts through the process. And, and on that trend, it's, it's difficult too for you to give, I mean you can give a guesstimate but you don't know if we're going to be up 20 staff in 12 months or down 20 staff or we might have 100, you know, it's, it's hard to give that, that, that figure. Um, because you don't know what our staffing numbers will be in six or 12, 18 months. None of us do. Uh, it's a budget. Yeah, but it's recorded yearly through the budget. Yeah, but, but he doesn't, but for, for Thursday night, that's my point. Yeah. Um, doesn't know. Councillors, the, the point is taken and, and that for Councillor Jurisi, which was um, motioned before us, it, it, just seeking that, that extra yeah, information, we yeah. won't be able to give absolute. Um, there's no ability to do that, but I think council and the community through the resolution of council need to be clear that um, there is a cost. Um, there is also the potential for that cost to flow, and mm -hmm. we can look at some variable amounts that sit around that for you to resolve upon. And thank you, Mr. CEO, and that's what I'm reflecting on. In the Services and Organisation Committee, figures were quoted. In this recommendation, there are no figures quoted. It doesn't explain the, the reason for the changes. What I would like is something along the lines of what was in the, the, the original with the correct figures in there, with the understanding that it can vary. I think the recommendation was better in the services and organisation committee, it's just the figures weren't correct. Yeah. Point, point taken, Councillor Drusley. Anybody else wish to speak to the motion to refer to the ordinary? Put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you Trent. Uh, Next item is item three, report to the Director of the General Committee, application for minor change to develop and approval for home-based business, small-scale meat processing at 82 Patterson Drive, Tim Biwa. Uh, welcome Lisa, Patrick and Leah. Hello, Lisa, are you speaking to this report, giving us an overview of what we're looking at? We can definitely give you a summary, yeah. Thank you. Okay. The proposal is for a minor change to an existing approval for a home-based business, which is a small-scale meat processing facility. Uh, the applicant proposes to increase um, the processing from five carcasses to ten and allow um, the collection of products once per week, where currently there's no collections. The recommendation in the report actually it supports this request as the operations remain consistent with the home-based business parameters. Further, the applicant is seeking to delete Condition 21 that specifies the currency period until the 17th of December this year, unless, un unless extended otherwise by council, <coughs> and provided there's no complaints received from nearby residents concerning breaches of the development conditions. In this regard, over the last 12 months, there's been one resident primarily complained. Upon the investigation, uh, compliance officers did not find there was a breach of the development conditions or the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, notwithstanding this, the report recommends to change condition 21 to extend the currency period for a further two years until the 17th of December 2024. Question, what's the purpose of extending the currency period? The operator has indicated that they intend to move operations off site. Uh, so the original suggestion was between about 18 and 24 months is what he's moving towards. So we thought that it was um, prudent to include that, but also to give him the flexibility to, to investigate options and moving off site in the future. Okay. Questions for staff or anyone like to move a recommendation? I have questions. questions. Mm -hmm. um, five carcasses to ten, uh, sorry, five carcasses to ten carcasses. The report indicates that that equates to 15 tonnes per annum. Um, my question is, um, 15 tonnes per annum is my calculations, I I worked out, um, fifteen tons is fifteen thousand kilos, or just to put it in like you know, so we all understand what fifteen thousand kilos looks like. If you look at five hundred gram packets of say mince and there's venison mince, there's venison meat, five hundred grams, we're looking at thirty thousand packs of five hundred grams of 
venison meat, venison sausages, venison leg, venison shoulders. Um, if you divide that by the number of days he's allowed to operate, that's 115 packs a day or 575 packs of 500 grams of mince per week. My question is, um, how is that considered domestic in scale? Okay. Um. Well, I think the, um, the home-based business is operating in a small building. They're bringing in the material on one occasion per week. Um, the, there's no requirement in the planning scheme under the code that the facility can't operate each day. So I think that it is, in terms of its impacts, it's not, it's not like an industrial operation in terms of its noise, um, in terms of the equipment that's coming to the site. The size of the shed is quite small. Um, our planning scheme says that on properties less than four hectares, um, that the home business only includes operations that are low impact industry. Um, this property, the business is operating on a property that is less than one hectare, 7,822 <coughs> square metres. So according to our NUSA plan, medium impact industry should not be on a property of this size. Um, the report states the same, that it doesn't comply with that benchmark. Um, why is it allowed to operate, given that it is defined under the NUSA plan as a medium industry impact, uh, medium industry business, um, and it's located on a property that is less than one hectare um, in area? Our scheme at the moment currently terms all food processing operations as me medium impact industry. So if someone's essentially processing jams, putting together spice packs or anything like that, it automatically brings it in as medium impact industry. My understanding is that this will be looked at through the planning scheme amendments process. So it doesn't, the scheme at the moment doesn't give recognition or doesn't really appreciate or show where the, those medium impact industries that should be um, excluded from those residential areas. Really? Our planning scheme says that noise generating machinery or mechanical plant use for the home business is enclosed within a building and not located within a hundred metres of a sensitive land use, including a dwelling house on an adjoining property. The proposed activity includes noise generating machinery, compressors for mechanical cooling, bandsaw and mincers. It's located 50 metres within 50 minute, metres of an adjoining dwelling house on an adjoining property. <coughs> Why are we allowing this business to operate within 50 metres of, it, of the adjoining property? It's notable that the, um, the operator's premise is in closer proximity of the shed than an adjo any adjoining dwelling. It's, it's, suited, it's located, as you'll see um, through the report, uh, we think very close proximity of the house. Um, I've been to the site, um, Lisa's been to the site, and Leo has been to the site, and we've had the operator operate the machinery. We've stood inside the shed while it was on and could hear how loud it was in the shed, and we walked outside the shed. Um, this has got very significant insulation on this shed to enable it to operate as the cool room. Um, it's also hematically sealed, um, which is a pressure seal. Um, to, and that limits noise capacity to, to leave the building. 
And when he was operating the bandsaw, I walked outside the building and I couldn't hear anything. I closed the door and straight away I could not hear anything. And I'm comfortable that the separation that's provided is suitable in relation to the noise from this operation. Yeah, so just looking at the home based business code um, and talking about the business as such, how many employees are, is there in this business, do we know? None, it's just the operator. Okay, and how big is the shed that he's working out of? Um, is it 57 square metres? Yes. Right, okay, yeah. and, how often are, and how often are deliveries allowed per, per week? Or how, how often is he allowed to harvest? So currently once a week he harvests. Right. And in our condition we've included. And in the condition, the additional condition you're asking us to look at, condition 14, mm -hmm. is it that he's allowed to a, a small van to obtain deliveries between eight and four once a week that's, to pick up? That's correct. That, yeah, right. Up. Yes. So in, in, in looking at that, those statements and what you've just said and those requirements, the fact that there's one person, 57 square metres, allowed to harvest once a week and allowed to pick up deliveries between nine and four one day a week. Is that, would that be considered very much a home-based business in line with other home-based businesses you have seen? Definitely. And would, I would say would even have less impact than other home-based businesses with other provisions allowing so yoga classes, I think four times a day, up to four people per class, of, you know, those kind of activities. So you'd have a lot of people coming and going on a rural residential property. So there's very, very limited impact in terms of the operation and vehicles coming and going from the site. Okay, thank you. It's a question of context. Um, in your report, you mentioned about 18 acceptable outcomes under the planning scheme regarding this. 15 of them are fine. Now, the three that, a couple of, two or three, some of which Councillor Lawrence mentioned, I make reference to being subservient to a performance outcome. Uh, can you explain what that performance outcome seeks to achieve and why that overrides the, the couple of acceptable outcomes that don't apply? The acceptable outcomes are basically a measure and a way to achieve the performance outcomes. So where they don't meet the acceptable outcomes, which is a measure, um, we then go and uh, assess it against the performance outcome. So there is some acknowledgement that there is some non-compliance against the acceptable outcomes, and therefore we've assessed it against the performance outcomes, and that's our final report. And what does the performance outcome seek to do? Well, it's P-O-P-O-9, yeah. I think it is. P-O-R-K-P-O-9, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Makes reference to impacts from dust and noise and vibration and sound. Yeah, yeah. so it's really about those, those particular impacts and, and how they can be um, mitigated. Um, so we've done that through, through the assessment. We've determined that, that noise is um, very unprobable in terms of um, external to the shed. Um, the other noise, I guess, that can be acknowledged is the vehicles coming and going. There's restriction of just one su suggestion, one collection per week, uh, and then one harvest per week. Uh, so that keeps down those um, those impacts in terms of the vehicle movements. Um, so I guess, yeah, we've talked about odour before. We've had no evidence that there's been any, any um, odour. So where the compliance officers have gone out, there's been no evidence of odour. So, yeah. The other question I have is um, part of the one year trial permit was uh, complaints would be considered serious <coughs> success. Can you um, tell us what the nature of the complaints, how many people complain, and the nature of the complaints and what your assessment of those complaints were, please? Okay, so in the 12 months, we've had a series of, of complaints from one complainant um, and one other complaint. Uh, since, so that's over the 12 months, uh, we've had a compliant, two compliance officers go out and, and review that. Um, they haven't found any breach of the conditions of the approval or the Environmental Protection Act. 
Um, yeah, so I guess in terms of, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what, yeah. Um, so there has been. Complaints weren't validated. No. Terms of noise impacts. That's correct. Yeah. So there's been a, a quite a lot of complaints, complaints. Over, over time, and they have been investigated and, and quite thoroughly, and it's been demonstrated that those complaints haven't been substantiated. With regard to um, one of the things, one of the things that was mentioned when this came before us originally was uh, uh, the amount of waste that this process would uh, potentially generate and uh, the, the odour through um, pump outs and the like. Do we know how many times the uh, the sewage system has had to be pumped out during that 12 month period at all and uh, whether that's any more or less than that would be expected from a normal use of a of a residential property on that, on such a such a landhold? Not specifically. Um, when we were on site the the operator uh, showed us how much waste had been accumulated in a period of I think it was a week, a week and a half yeah. and it was probably half a bucket of material was a very low amount of waste. Which is in the keeping with what he suggested would be the... That's right, original. because they're so productive in how they use the beast when it comes to their property in terms of using the skins and, and other elements of the beast, they really, they use it all um, in terms of going to market. Um, the report does note that the wastewater treatment system um, was, their final inspection was issued in December 2021 and then since that time there'd been three well, it had been regular three monthly compliance inspections um, with no issues found. And the, my understanding is the reason for there being minimal waste is that the animals are actually slaughtered off site and so the processing of the meat on site. That's correct. And, and, and he only brings, he, he leaves part of the beast in the field and he brings back um, that part of the animal that he, he's seeking to harvest. Thank you. So he, he indicated, Councillor, that originally the hooves were being brought back. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, you're only really getting just the carcass. So no head, no hooves. Uh, insides are left on site. Uh, the rest of the rest of the beast is pretty much utilised. Yeah. Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Sewell. Um, you mentioned there's been quite a lot of complaints. Um, what are, what is the number? In the last twelve months, from the one complaint, it, we've had around about between 20 and 8, 28 and 30 complaints. So from what the one complaint and 28 to 30 complaints, how many people are impacted by the facility? Directly impacted by the facility? Is it that one complaint, complainant? Well, we don't think that they've actually been impacted. Okay, so the complaints have come from the adjoining property owner. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And there are other adjoining properties and there's been no complaints from those properties. So where the facility is located 50 metres next to a boundary um, is the adjoining boundary the complainant? Um, the one that's located 50 metres from the process. Maybe I'll show facility. you page 7 of yep. the report. Um, the property is accessed via Battle Axe Driveway. Yep. I've which, been to the property. Yeah, yeah, which goes past an adjoining neighbour. Yeah. And that's where the complaints have been coming from. Um, along that driveway, the sort of the long boundary of that driveway is yeah. obviously another property for, with the dwelling. Yeah. And there's been no complaints received from that property. My understanding is that because that's a battle axe property, that as the vehicle goes up, and most of the complaints have been about the lights and the lights shining into the property. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the most significant complaint? It's been a range of complaints. It's been a range of complaints about it. Sorry, Joe, Councillor yeah, Stewart. So, so just talking on those range of complaints, if we look at them, one of the complaints was operating with additional persons. And please, and correct me, I'm going to ask this, was that um, that it was found that that was friends attending the property at the time? That's correct. That's okay. There's been a, Madam Mayor, there's been a number, through the Chair, there's, there's been a number of complaints along those lines about employees, but they're all been uns, unsubstantiated through our investigations. Right. The next one was vehicle noise during the night and light pollution upon entry. Um, this is one vehicle, one night a week. 
Is, is that correct? That's correct. And we have proof on camera of dimming lights of the car on video. Is that correct? That's correct. And there's presence of art being for both properties. Is it correct in that there's presentation of ve presence of vegetation and screening between the properties was also noted? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Allegations of noise emissions at night that um, the report states that after investigation and in accordance with EPA, Environmental Protection Act, this would not constitute a breach as defined by env as an environmental nuisance. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Complaints about odour. In accordance with report and investigations done, there was no odour present at the facility at the time of the inspections and this was despite the fact that the meat products were in storage. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Odour from the septic tank. The septic tank has undergone regularly three monthly compliance inspections by a qualified person and no issues found in this regard. No odour has been observed according to our report. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Mayor Stewart, if we're just reading from the report, I think... I just want clarification on camera that this is the people who may not have the, the, the ability to read the report or interest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The last one, and it's the last one, thank you for the latitude, Mr Chair. Mm -hmm. The wastewater treatment system similarly does not constitute a breach as defined as an environmental nuisance. That's is that correct. correct? Thank you. Okay. I just have a question. Yes, yeah. Councillor um, Thank you. Um, I did go out last year on more than one occasion and spoke to neighbours. Um, the complaint here is about um, a comment that the business is more likely suited to the municipal, industrial or commercial estate. How, moving forward, is does council measure the growth and expansion of the business? You've said that the business owner has stated that he thinks that's, what, 18 or 24 <coughs> months away. Um, how does the plan measure the growth and expansion of the business indicates that it's time to move, aside from what the business owner tells us? It'll be reflective in the intensity of the operations that are occurring on site. So if, if, he's, if he's needing to go out into the field and harvest more beasts and he's got more visits coming back to the site, if he needs more area to store the beasts, um, if he's got more people wanting to come to the site to, you know, to take orders, that would be uh, an example of obviously of the building of the business growing mm -hmm. and that at some point that it may not be suitable. The business operator certainly got plans to grow the business and um, some of those plans are quite innovative and he certainly acknowledges that he would need to move off site to fulfil those. Councillor Joseph, if you've moved the motion. I haven't moved the motion yet, actually. No. So given that um, oh, given that uh, that's the situation, why um, extend a further two years? as opposed to an, an additional one for, to give the operator time, seeing as a, the, the growth uh, in operations going forward looks to have uh, been successful in the first 12 months. Why were we given another 12 months? Uh, another two years to... Because uh, who's looking about 18 months to two years to... Take place within 18 months. Yeah, to, to grow the business to a point if his okay. plans are successful. Thank you. In that case, I will move the committee, re uh, the um, staff recommendation, but I'll add a point Amend B to amend condition 19 to read. The access handle must be densely landscaped with native plants and shrubs to provide a dense screen to vegetation between the driveway and neighbouring residents. The landscape bed, garden bed along the southern boundary adjacent lot 61 RP 686676 pool area must be enhanced with supplementary planting B8. And I believe the spelling needs to be corrected here. Council Stockwells, Australia. Austral should be Australi or Sagisium loom manii with a minimum stock size of 45 litres of density of one plant per metre. All supplementary planting works must be undertaken one month from the date of this approval. Now, just to clarify, just to clarify the elements of that, I've asked staff for to look at what the gaps are with regard to um, uh, impact from car lights and or noise on the site. This is what uh, the staff and the, uh, the head of planning has, uh, has advised would be uh, sufficient additional planting to uh, uh, create density and or minimise the impact of light, uh, lights from uh, vehicles entering the driveway. So just a question of staff. The original report last year mm. required landscaping. Mm. How is this is this, how does this fit with what has been required and implemented already? So uh, the original uh, garden bed has been planted out. 
the condition probably in, in the permit that had been issued probably wasn't specific enough with the planning. So it was deemed to be densely planted, but upon looking at the concerns raised, continued with respect to the spill of the, the, the headlight or the, the, the light going up the driveway as such, um, it was pertinent that uh, this is a supplementary planting and larger plants to be put into that. There's a, there's a I suppose it's about a six to eight metre bit gap in the landscape. It's, most of the landscape is quite high, except there's one portion there, which probably just, it just needs the supplementary planting to, to um, fill that, that gap. So how many vehicle movements are there of, of week due specifically to the business? Where light would be an issue? Yes. Well, there's one once a week where he's harvesting the beasts and that's where he comes back at night. He does go to the markets on the weekend and uh, that would be during the day, uh, maybe early in the morning. And then he, through this approval that they're now seeking the change, there'd be an additional vehicle that would come to the site, but that's between 8 and 4 p.m. For collection. For, for a collection. Okay, so basically two movements a week, one bringing the, the, the carcasses in, one taking material away and his vehicle going to the mine. That's correct. So, okay, thank you. Uh, so would we have a second to the um, motion, please? Uh, I was going to hit my bets in case I had to amend something, but I'll, I'll do a second. Councillor Stockwell second, Councillor Jurisdiction. Look, I, I don't do this lightly. I do this on the basis of the fact that. 12 months ago, we acknowledged that this met the planning scheme and it was done with, uh, with conditions uh, to see what the impact would be. Staff have assessed the, the impacts and the complaints uh, made and the, one of the significant ones that I've got and, and reading from uh, the emails received was that lights <coughs> are still impacting on the residents. Now, it may or may not be from the business operation. It may be just vehicles coming and going because the driveway serves several properties. Not just that. So an additional, I believe, some additional planting here may impact, may in fact help minimise or reduce the issue of light impact upon the uh, upon the adjoining property, and may alleviate the problem. The approval is for another two years. One of the concepts of small base business on a on a property is that as it grows and expands, and the opportunity to present itself through the planning scheme is for businesses to. Um, start up as a home-based business, grow and expand to the point where they become a commercial operation. Once they're commercially viable, they can move into a commercial precinct. That's what the operator has asked for in this instance. He suggested that that as he grows and expands beyond anything, beyond what this is requested, is what he needs to move into a viable commercial premises. I'm supporting a local small business trying to get to that stage in, in approving this. Councillor Yeah, I just had a, s a question about con the amendment to Condition 21. It isn't unusual in these circumstances to put a year on the first time around, but it is pretty unusual then to put another period after that. If the use is suitable, the use is suitable. Did the applicant actually request only two years, or is that something that staff have suggested because there's a political campaign underway? The applicants sought to delete the condition. Point of order. A political campaign. Point of order. There is no point of order. She uses it to disrupt my line of questioning and I'd like her to be sanctioned. Thank you. Um, what's the point of order? Um, when he said they, he made reference that this was political. So my, my point of order stands. That is not a point of order. Okay. So Chair, 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 look, um, continue on. I'm interrupted. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, the applicant sought to delete the condition. Um, we acknowledge that we have a business that um, we're receiving complaints from. We have been to the site and we feel that the approval, or the operation complies with the approval. Notwithstanding, there are, um, he's changing his operation. He's going to bring more beasts back. Um, so we would like to give ourselves the opportunity for further review. Okay. Um, I will just make a general note um, of councillors that we can
cannot impugn improper motives to fellow councillors at the table. Um, that's just a general note. Thank you. I'll talk then. Um, um, I don't know if other can I'm the only one, but I've certainly, as a political representative, been lobbied on this. That's a political campaign. There was no imputation whatsoever on any other councillor. Mm. I'm just saying yeah. this matter is political. I, I wasn't saying yep. that you were yep. doing that. And, no. and I, did, I do object to now, two and nearly three years in, that councillors still don't know the standing orders. Okay, so going to the point at hand. Um, <coughs> we had this debate last year. There has been a minor increase. Um, I support the addition of some extra landscaping uh, because there's, there's, there's two ways to create nuisance. One is, is real and one is the perceived. Having a visual buffer will help and it's always good to, uh, uh, to have a real reason to plant more trees. Never, never not support a condition that requires a developer to plant more trees. Um, it is consistent with what we're trying to achieve in the rural zone and the rural residential zone. It is about building small scale, niche, food based manufacturing that builds on uh, local produce, in this case builds on a pest animal uh, in, in nearby uh, council areas um, and turns it into um, a, a food product that is being sold at local markets. It is, by definition, a sustainable local value chain. It is what we recommended uh, be included as part of the current regional <coughs> statutory plan as well as our own planning scheme for what should occur in these areas. We've had years worth of experience and that experience suggests there's been no validated complaints. Um, the upside of suggesting Sagisium australian and Sagisium lumini is they have edible fruits, so maybe we can have um, uh, deer in a in a rye berry um, marinade in the future. Councillor Stockwell, if councillors wish to speak to the motion, Councillor Wigginer. Um, I don't know what Sagisium australia and Sagisium, the names of the plants. I have a very hard time supporting a motion where I don't actually know the plants that I'm supporting. We can have someone at the lunch yeah, they're, they're, they're both local lily pillies. They're lily pillies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, if you look at the deadly, deadly um, native fruit palm, yeah. a lot of lumina and, and some Australia. And my understanding also, Leo, you may be able to reiterate that there's a limit to the height that these will grow, which was a concern of the the neighbours regard to the potential. Yeah, I think, yeah I think I think the one point eight two two and a half metres thereabouts, um, but they're a quick quicker growing species as well. So. Thank you. Okay. I've got a question Can about trees. Yeah, I hear what um, Councillor um, Tom is saying. Uh, what about the root system in these trees? We have a lot of issues regarding driveways and roots, sorts of plants. How who's recommended this tree? Our, our environmental officer, uh, through the chair, yes. has recommended these species. Thank you. Yeah, the councillors wish to speak to motion. Yeah, I, I, you go. No, you go. No, I've got a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, just on 18C, um, that is a new, is that right? It just says to amend existing condition at 18 new point C. That's that, that was a new point, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. And that's just to ensure that, that only one day a week? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can speak, I'm still putting new okay, points. I'll, I'll put it, I'll, okay. Um, I'll speak to this. Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Um, well, this is a very emotive issue and I appreciate the concerns outlined by neighbouring property. This matter came, as before, came before us exactly one year ago. It's not an easy decision, there's still much emotion around it. Um, but the issues that were at play one year ago are still very much at play now. This morning we have before us an application for a minor change to an impact accessible application. We have a recommendation by staff which asks us to change condition 5 to allow from 5 to 10 carcasses being processed per week. Permission of collection of food products will occur once per week by a small refrigerated van one day from 9am to 4pm to amend condition 21 to read that the permit lapses on the 17th of December 2024 which is in two years. 
and then the addition of 18C to ensure that the delivery of the harvested animals only occurs one day per week. No other changes. In relation to condition five and the request for change to include the five to 10 carcasses, uh, there'll be no increase in movement of cars, only allowed one, one night per week to harvest, no increase to hours allowed to trade, no change to requirements to dim lights, no changes to requirements of any noise associated with the trailer to occur, no change to the delivery time of occurrence of harvested animals to site. In relation to condition 14, a request for change, permission of collection of food products is once per week by a small refrigerated van during nine to the hours of nine to four. Over the past 12 months, the applicant has had to adhere to stringent conditions of approval. And according to our report, he has. He has complied in full. Of that, there is no dispute. Our report states that Council has received from one complainant raising concerns and many, a number of times and on one other occasion, another single complainant. According to our report, all complaints have been investigated and Council's De Development Compliance Officer, Environmental Health Coordinator, have concluded that the business is operating in compliance with all developmental approval conditions and no environmental nuisance is occurring under the Environmental Protection Act of 1994. We've talked about the snapshot of complaints. I've dealt with them individually. I have been um, attended both properties. Um, I did so last year. Uh, and for me, and this is my opinion, but when I was standing on the neighbouring property as well as outside the uh, area of work, there was no visual impacts, no smells, and no noise emitting from the property in question in regard to the concerns raised. In my opinion, there was no impact on residential amenity that was visible or tangible. The extension of the permit of time for another two years, which staff have put on, will, uh, will fairly allow this small home business to transition into an off-site operation. Just as any small business grows and transitions, the neighbours should take comfort in the fact that in this case, the same will occur. The business is growing and the addition of two more years will ensure that the business owners continue to prove the concept and value of the business, that expansion is planned and with every confidence it will occur and the premises will be relocated. I said before that this is an emotive issue and I appreciate and understand concerns raised, but I must make a decision based on compliance with the Noosa plan. I must make a decision on the facts that I had in front of me, the evidence before me. I must make a decision on what I saw, what I heard and what I smelt one year ago and the evidence and facts outlined in the report before us today, one year on, with evidence gathered over the past 12 months. However unpopular my decision is, and I appreciate the neighbours' angst, this is not a pretty topic, a pretty subject. I accept and understand that. Sometimes it's best to do what feels safe, and sometimes it's better to do what you consider is right, even though the costs may be high. The cost of my decision today may be high, but at the end of the day, I would not be doing what I believe is the right thing, and I could look, not look at myself in the mirror without knowing it. I could not, in all good conscience, not support this staff recommendation based on the evidence before me and based on what I have seen and experienced personally. It's with this in mind, with a deep belief that however unpopular this decision is, it is the right one, and weighing up the evidence before us and in view of our own endorsed plan, I believe it to be the right one at this point in time. It's balanced, it complies, and it's evidence-based. I support the staff recommendation. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. The proposed home business at 82 Patterson Drive, Timbeewa does not comply with the purpose and overall outcomes of the Home Business Code. Acceptable Outcome 9.1, Acceptable Outcome 9.2 and Acceptable Outcome 9.5 and can therefore not be supported. Acceptable outcome 9.1 states that a home business does not include an operation that would be otherwise defined as medium impact industry or high impact industry. A meat processing facility is defined as a medium impact industry and therefore this business does not comply with the Noosa plan. Acceptable outcome 9.2 states that a home based business that is located in an area less than four hectares, that is 14,000 square metres, must not include an operation that would be otherwise be defined as low impact industry. The property is, the business is located on a property that's 7,822 square metres, less than one hectare. 
A meat processing facility is a medium impact industry, not a low impact industry. Therefore, again, the home business does not comply to the Noosa plan. Acceptable outcome 9.5 states that noise generating machinery or mechanical plant used for the home business is enclosed within a building and not located within 100 metres of a sensitive land use, including a dwelling on an adjoining property. The proposed activity includes noise generating machineries and is located 50 metres from adjoining dwelling. Again, it does not comply with the Noosa plan. The Noosa plan is intended to guide development, development in Noosa in a way that achieves the will of the community. So why aren't we sticking to it? A median impact industry cannot be located in a rural residential zone, Noosa plan 2020. A medium impact industry is not domestic in scale, Noosa Plan 2020. A medium impact industry is not compatible with the preferred character of the area, Noosa Plan 2020. Patterson Drive is a rural residential estate. It's made up of small rural blocks, most under one hectare, where neighbours live shoulder to shoulder. This is not a location that's appropriate for a business of this nature or scale. The plan says so, and so did almost 500 residents who signed a petition that I presented to council 12 months ago. So why aren't we listening to the residents who live in Patterson Drive? Why aren't we listening to the residents who live within that local area? And why aren't we sticking to the plan? And why? Why isn't the mental health and well-being of the people most impacted by this decision, the adjoining neighbours, enough to justify a refusal. Okay. Development approvals have an impact. Councillor well, Morrison, could you direct your comments to me? Sorry, oh, I wasn't looking at staff. Okay. Development approvals have an impact well beyond the date of the decision notice. When we leave this room today, someone's going to be living with the decision we make today for the next two years. That someone is the adjoining neighbours. I'm going to read one of the letters that we have received from the neighbours to remind you of the impact that the decision that we made 12 months ago has on this fam young family. Quote, I can't enjoy my backyard, my pool, my amenity for myself with family or friends. I want to move from this area, but we didn't move from New South Wales to Noosa. We just because. We moved to Noosa because it's the only place in Australia that is surrounded by national parks. It's a beautiful place with amazing people. The sports, the culture and the diversity is what we moved, moved here for. We bought in Timbiwa because of its land, the peace, the quiet and the neighbourhood. If we knew we would be living next to a potential meat processing plant, we would never have even considered buying in this area. The last year has been an emotional roller coaster. Twelve months ago, we approved by majority a home business that has caused much stress, anguish, and anxiety to adjoining the adjoining neighbour. The conditions we imposed on the approval twelve months ago failed to protect the adjoining neighbour's mental health and well-being. What will two more years do? And why are we willing to accept this risk and tolerate an activity that we know will compromise the mental health and well-being of a young, young family? The applicant has already been given his break. He sought a retrospective approval 12 months ago. He got it. He's built his business and he's doubled his production to 15 tonnes or 15,240 kilos of deer meat per annum. Now it's time to give the neighbour a break. We have two choices today. One, to do the right thing, or two, to do what's right. I'm asking everyone, let's do what's right and put people before business. Thank you, Councillor Morrison. Yeah, I've got a question of staff, uh, and that it's, it's related to the answer you've already given in relation to Councillor Wilkie's question, um, but it's only a yes or no. 
Um, there was a range of times where Councillor Lawrence suggested that because uh, the development didn't meet an acceptable outcome, it didn't comply with the Noosa plan. Is that a correct statement? No. Um, there's an opening statement before all the acceptable outcomes were listed that it doesn't comp comply with the overall com outcome sought from home-based businesses which are listed in 2A to H, in your opinion, does it meet the overall outcomes of the home-based business code? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Um, is the Noosa plan, is there an element of discretion applied to interpretation of the benchmarks? Um, well, the benchmarks themselves um, are generally not discretionary. So it normally has a, a performance element to it. So if you don't meet it, that's an acceptable outcome, then you need to go to the performance outcome. So, um, and in this instance, the performance outcome nine talks about the nature and operation of a home-based business, not resulting in noise, vibration, odour, dust, and other pollutants like or radio that can be experienced outside the property boundary. So, um, it, it's quite clear in terms of its compliance or otherwise. Right. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Tom. I just would like to note that I, I really um, support rural residential. The zoning brings enormous opportunities for home based businesses. Uh, these opportunities, if the zoning brings enormous. Uh, opportunities for our Shire by supporting innovative businesses and fostering a resilient <coughs> economy. And um, I live in rural residential, and I love it, but it's noisy. The dog barks all day long next door. Early in the morning, the cockatoos are going. At sunset, the cockatoos are going all night long. From time to the year, the bats are flying around making a racket. Um, snakes and foxes wreak havoc on my chickens. Rural residential is a wild place and it's not quiet. It's not a quiet residential neighborhood. Rural residential, I believe, is a place where businesses and animals and it's hectic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wickener. Look, um, I'll speak to the motion. I support it. Um, I support it because this application does comply with the planning scheme. Uh, it provides the acceptable outcomes that are required to be met there about um, 18 listed for home-based businesses. Of the 18 conditions required under the payment scheme, the home-based business complies with 15 of them. And three of the don't are covered by the overriding consideration that the business does not result in noise, dust, vibration, odour, light, or glare impacting outside the property. I too visited the neighbouring property and heard from them firsthand their heartfelt pleas that the business not go ahead for a variety of reasons. They were genuinely concerned about the impact it would have in terms of the noise, the odour, the glare. Alternatively, I also visited the site to see for myself how it would be operating and specifically what noise would be emanating from the shed uh, when the bone saw was operating. And when it was, I could not hear it outside the shed. So I satisfied myself that there was no noise impacts the driveway was required to be screened with vegetation, and it has been. I support Councillor Derisovic's amendment to this that we'll see even more planting uh, take place along the driveway so that when the two vehicle movements a week that occur for collection and deliveries occurs, if that occurs at night time and they're dipping their lights, in combination with the dipping of the lights, there's less chance of any impact on the neighbour in terms of vehicle glare. Of course we sympathise and we seek to help everyone who seeks, who makes a, an earnest move for our help. Um, the acceptable outcomes that were met required to ensure that no employees, clients or customers will attend the site. The activity is operated by the landowner, Solly, who res resides on the site. Another acceptable outcome, the, the activity does not occupy more than 40% of the dwelling floor area. The home-based business is proposed to occur wholly within an existing small shed, which is um, 51.7 square metres. The maximum number of persons on site for business purposes is one person being the owner and one person for collection each week. 
instead of the limit of two deliveries a day allowed under a home-based business, one commercial collection per week is requested by the applicant. While goods can be sold on site, no goods are proposed to be sold on site. It is not anticipated that the home-based business will generate any noise portable beyond the property boundaries outside the hours of 8am to 5pm. And if the bandsaw is operating, I satisfy myself, it can't even be heard outside the shed itself. It's not anticipated that the home-based business would generate noise which exceeds five decibels at the site boundaries. Inspections by councillors uh, reveal virtually no sound could be heard outside the shed or the band saw is operating. The home-based business has not been found to produce dust, fumes, smoke or odour beyond the site boundaries. Vehicle parking for the sole operator is wholly within the site boundaries. The operator can enter and leave the site in forward gear. No, noisy, no sound from noisy um, vehicles reversing. Uh, with um, any uh, noise uh, beepers for reversing. The activity does not involve the use of heavy vehicles and the site has access to a sealed residential road that is not a 90 um, kilometre per hour road. The three aspects that don't meet the acceptable outcomes as mentioned previously in this debate regarding the type of industry size, size of the lot and presence of noise generating machinery do meet the overarching performance outcome which requires there to be no noise, dust, odour, vibration and light or glare impacts but the, and that the operation remains domestic in scale. This application is being approved because it is consistent with the sort of local food production we are seeking to encourage through the payment scheme. We don't wish to see this sort of activity in rural residential areas. We ought to change the payment scheme, not reject each compliant application until the scheme is changed. This permit to operate lapses in two years in December 2024 and it is running right that complaints are able to be continued to be lodged and assessed on their members. Uh, Councillor Drew, if you wish to close. Yes, look, um, thank you. The three councillors, um, uh, both councillors have uh, demonstrated the reasons why they uh, acknowledge and accept uh, what is before us. It's not a, we, we don't approve these things lightly. We don't approve these things easily. We do go into looking at it. Every councillor went on site and heard the you know, heard for themselves the, the potential impacts. And whilst this is considered a medium impact industry, being meat processing, the, 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 the operator, excuse me, of this business has shown that it's small in scale, it can be contained, the noise elements are contained within a hermetically sealed shed, and we've all satisfied ourselves that the noise doesn't emanate outside of that shed. So, whilst uh, 9.2 is, uh, uh, is the one that refers to medium impact industry, and as well as 9.1, it shows that even a medium impact industry being meat processing can be, can, can be managed in such a way that it minimises the impacts as is required by the conditions placed upon it. And this one clearly has. The additional um, uh, number of carcasses are going to be processed in exactly the same manner which uh, the current five carcasses are. No more, no less with regards to transport to and from site, apart from a daytime operation of collection by commercial vehicle once a week via a small refrigerated van. Now to suggest that those impacts are any more uh, onerous on, uh, on, um, on neighbours or on the neighbourhood, um, I can't see that. I see that as a very, very minimal impact. In fact, it has been suggested that something like a yoga studio with four people coming would have four vehicles parked, could operate day in, day out, and, uh, and would have a far greater impact with regard to vehicle transport uh, movements to and from a site. So I've satisfied myself uh, that, uh, that this operation is small scale, has, from what I've heard from the staff, like the other councillors have said, satisfied that uh, they have met all the conditions that have been placed upon them, that the noise is contained within, and that one of the most significant impacts that I've understood from the neighbours is the lights, by adding additional planting of a mature nature, I hope that that will help facilitate uh, any light um, uh, impacts on the adjoining site for the neighbours. So uh, I support the staff recommendation that this continues. Uh, I acknowledge that it continues for two years and I think that's a good thing seeing as that the operator has envisaged that within two years this small scale operation 
will have grown sufficiently with market uh, opportunities and the like to then proceed to a commercial premises. Put the motion those in favour. Councillor Finzel, Wegner, Jurisovic, Stockwell, Stewart, Wilkie, and against. Councillor Lawrenson. Thank you. Councillors, with your permission, with the motion to carry? Sure. Comfort break? It's carried. It's carried. It's carried. It's carried. It's carried. Ten minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
acknowledge that we've um, got some business to do. Okay, welcome back uh, to the General Committee meeting. We've, we're up to item four, which is the Planning and Environment Court Appeal, number B68, 2022, Application for Operational Works, Prescribed Title Works at 10 to 12 Ravenwood Drive, Moosa Heads, page 22 of the General Committee meeting agenda, and we've got Patrick and Leo here. Councillors may recall in April of this year um, there was a refusal of an application, a retrospective application for a jetty and also a jet ski dry storage pontoon. Um, mm -hmm. That jetty had been constructed some time ago and it had been uh, constructed, uh, well it wasn't constructed in accordance with the approval at that time. Um, so it was refused and subsequently appealed. Um, now, throughout the course of the, you know, the early stages of the appeal, we've received adv advice that council is unlikely to be successful in the matter if we proceed, um, primarily due to the amount of time since the, um, the jetty has been constructed and, and the, the refusal of the application um, on the basis, I think it was 27 years, and also at the time um, there was an inspection by a council officer and it's also noted that the properties have changed hands. So it's been recommended that we uh, settle the appeal and a set of conditions have been prepared between the parties. Notably, the conditions uh, include a requirement for the jet ski dock um, to be wholly removed. Okay. Well, I'm happy to move the recommendation. Move Councillor Stockwell, second to Councillor Jurisovic. Councillor Stockwell. Oh yeah, it was always a a difficult decision to make it was about <coughs> the rights of one landowner versus the rights of the other. At the, at, on the time, we, um, the majority of us went for uh, the rights of the, the landholder that whose access was being inhibited. But as you say, the legal advice is uh, defending that that position is unlikely to be successful. So it is wise to resolve it without additional costs. Happy to support the staff recommendation as we said at the time. I mean, this has been uh, a jetty that's been in place for a, a long time, nearly 30 years. Um, did have a piece of uh, piece of paper that said it was approved. And at the time, I said when we, this came before us, said this wouldn't pass the pub test, mm -hmm. and I'm glad we're at the point where the pub test would uh, would actually win. So um, I'm happy to support staff recommendation to settle this and uh, allow the structure. Councillor Lawrence, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Stewart. I've got a question, Lee. Did you have a question? Oh, just a quick one. Um, in terms of cost, um, do we have an idea of how much we've spent in legals um, in defending this? Oh, if it's okay, if I could yes. shoot you an email about that, Councillor, if that's okay. Um, and can I also ask for consideration that we include in the reports um, legal cost, um, okay. just to get an idea of what this is costing ratepayers. Thank you. Councillor Yeah, thank you. Just a question on the 21st of April. This was a 4-3 vote. It was, it was very close. Um, um, now, we've, we're at a point where, you know, we have to um, settle an appeal or we're asked to. Uh, is there an opportunity to circumvent where we are now? It's happened before. I can name three separate occurrences. Is there an opportunity to um, when these these issues are at play, and it may not be possible, it might be a question of the CEO, can we have some preliminary legal advice that so we don't get to this point that, you know, it, guys, I mean, it says here in, in this, you know, little chance of success, that's, you know, little chance of prospects. So there's the ability to have that earlier so that we haven't come this one step forward. You know, we're now five, six, seven, eight months down the track. <coughs> Is there that ability? To the chair, Mayor, look, it, it is difficult. Uh, each refusal, um, the applicant always has the right to be able to um, then challenge that refusal. Uh, mm. that, that, and the recommendation and ultimately the decision that the council has made. Um, I, I think for us, and something that we can workshop with the council overall, that if we are looking at a refusal, that mm. there is um, a legal brief that's yeah. provided to the council right. around that. Um, as always, it does come with costs, um, but we also want to ensure that 
our officers are, are supportive in their views and their actions and undertaking. So I, I think it is worthwhile that we workshop this as um, a, a way forward into the future that if there is a refusal and we do see risk, um, so maybe a first step would actually be to be able to look at what a, a risk rating would mm. be around this and if it reaches right. the threshold of a risk rating, um, because there are those applications that are just an outright refusal. Um, they are what they are. Those though that do have a degree of risk, um, that we put that to council and council has its ability to gauge its own risk appetite based on the information provided. Um, I think I'll take a note for that. It's yeah. something we can Thank put you. forward in a workshop into the next Because year. if we look at that triple bottom line, social, environmental and economic, that would surely, um, legal implications would form part of the economic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll take that Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So, yeah, if there was an element of legal advice predetermined in a situation like this, would that mean that um, we may have to go into confidential sessions to uh, review that legal advice every time one of these decisions to defend or to, uh, to refuse uh, an application mm -hmm. goes forward? Through, through the chair, um, absolutely, Councillor Jerisi. And um, I, that's where just, just thinking out loud at the moment that whether a risk rating is maybe a better way to, to work on that and well, council can understand yeah. we can provide advice as to risk. But there is some thought that I think is required um, around this approach. Yeah, one would think that would um, facilitate the position of someone um, wanting to uh, appeal a decision, knowing Council's position on it prior to actually undergoing an appeal process. Through the Chair, absolutely correct. Councillor Jury speech, you're briefing your opposition before you have the chance to make a decision on the matter. There, there, there's some work to be done, something to think about, I think, uh, but um, as always, save us to boss. Um, I want to circumvent that. Um, something for us to work on, I uh, think, as officers and councillors and, and get a formula on a way forward. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Mm. Just to close, Councillor Stockwell, put the motion as in favour. That is unanimous. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Thanks, Patrick. the um, Noosa Reef Health Monitoring Program, page 27. And we have Cheyenne here. Hello, Cheyenne. Hello, Hello councillors. Hello, Hello, Mayor. Hello, Hello, Cheyenne. Hello, Scott. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you wish to give us uh, a briefing on this, please? Cheyenne? Yeah. Yes. I'll start just by saying that I'm filling in for our Principal Environment Officer, Amy Kimber, because she's away at the moment on holiday. Um, I also have a conflict of interest. I used to be a climate change uh, ambassador for Reef Check Australia. And so I wasn't part of the decision-making process to bring Reef Check on or to engage them. Um, I'm just supporting because I have knowledge of the work that they do and what they propose the council to be doing in the future. So what is proposed? Okay, so <laughs> Reef Check proposes to take uh, surveys of our offshore coral reefs um, once every 24 months. Uh, they've identified um, five sites on three reefs. Um, that they have monitored in 2011, 12 and 13, and then again in 2018 with council support. Every year they do monitoring of the coral reefs uh, around Southeast Queensland for various councils such as Sunshine Coast Council, and they prepare a Southeast Queensland monitoring report, which we have been part of in the past, but we have not monitored since 2018. Um, the benefit of monitoring is that uh, we get to understand our coral reef ecosystems better. We know how important they are from a biodiversity perspective, from a fisheries perspective, uh, from a recreation perspective. There's also the coastal protection perspective for protecting our coastlines from climate change, uh, climate change hazards, coastal hazards. And that's one that we have not yet valued, but that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to engage them is to understand what value our reefs are providing in terms of coastal protection. Um, and so, yeah, the, the other reasons that it's important to monitor our reefs is that they can provide an early indication of algal blooms and unhealthy waters in the Noosa River, and I think that's one of the bases, bases that Amy um, decided this is an important project. They can also uh, give us an indication of coral bleaching and marine debris, um, as well as um, impact from anchors from boats. And so. I think it's a, an important project to monitor our reefs and I think it's important that it's outside of the grant process because 
it um, it aligns with our environment strategy very closely um, on environmental monitoring, and it is a core technical service that, to my understanding, only Reef Check provides in Southeast Queensland, and they use citizen science and a um, and a peer-reviewed methodology for surveying the reefs. Just a, a general question: mm -hmm. Councils normally concern themselves with land-based activities. Mm -hmm. Are there other bodies, state bodies, that are, have a responsibility for monitoring this sort of Good question. these sort of um, uh, features, natural yeah. features? That's an excellent question. Um, to the is, best there, is there a knowledge bank we can already draw on? Is this work being done by the state government, for example? Yeah, not to my not to my knowledge. I don't think that the state government undertakes ongoing monitoring of offshore coral reefs, even though it would fall under their remit. Um, certain government bodies, but. Um, uh, my understanding is it's mostly left to councils. And I think that Noosa Council, we pride ourselves on best practice land conservation <clears throat> approaches, and we should replicate that offshore. And we should make sure that our, our ocean ecosystems are also kept up to best practice as we have done on land. Uh, Joe, then Brian. So yeah, given, on, given from what you uh, said earlier, I would have uh, suggested Along the lines of what, what the question Frank asked was the first question that came to my mind, but um, suggested this is perhaps a litmus, te litmus test of what happens on land, flows into the waterways, and then then out in the ocean. So this is an, an area where we can have a have a check and a test that facilitates our, our understanding of whether our practices on land are being well facilitated, or whether there are there are things that we can still do better. That's our idea. Yeah, and when we discussed it uh, amongst the coordinators, the leadership team within the environment branch, that's what we landed on as being a key value for us. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I've got some of the questions that I think Cheyenne will be able to answer, but some that I think I'm going to have to get answered before Thursday and may not be able to yeah. before Thursday. Um, the first one is, um, in terms of uh, the environment strategy, it talks about using reef surveys once every five years, not once every two. Mm -hmm. Does the climate hazard adaptation plan or climate response plan suggest a more frequent level of uh, surveying is required to the once in five year that the environment strategy suggests? Not specifically, but my understanding is that that has been reviewed by the leadership within the environment branch and they believe that that was misguided it should be once every two years and Craig Doolin who was the previous environment manager in one of his assessment reports for a previous reef check survey noted that once every five years is not sufficient it should be once every two years. Okay, um, A range of the criteria that they do assess uh, will talk to both biodiversity and climate change mm -hmm. um, they don't appear to measure uh, levels of ocean acidification. Is that something you're aware of, or is that something we need to get uh, clarity on before Thursday? I've spoken to them in the past about this. I think having a spot sample of the acidity in one location um, doesn't provide um, an overall picture of acidifying oceans. It'd be like taking a sea level rise measurement in one location. Um, and so I believe they rely on CSIRO and Bureau of Meteorology to gather that data. Um, but I can follow up with them and ask them whether that's something that they can add to their program in the future if it's methodologically sound. Okay. Um, from a climate change perspective, there are significant differences between nearshore, inshore, shallow reefs and deeper reefs, is that correct? And you'd, correct. You'd, you'd want to see the trends in both those sort of locations, if you could, is that right? That is, to my understanding, yes, that's right. So in the 2018-2019 project we funded, mm -hmm. uh, they made a comment in their acquittal report mm -hmm. that was, um, despite the coastline appearing similar to conditions found for the length of the Sunshine Coast region, many shallow areas of the coastline do not host easily accessible reef areas. Many of the most well-known Noosa reefs within the fishing and boating community are too deep to conduct uh, Reef Check Australia survey activities due to our stringent survey protocols, i.e. reefs were often deeper than 25 metres. And I note that the same reefs less one is what's proposed here, so we're not actually going to be monitoring the reefs where most of the fishing activity is occurring and most of the people see as the reefs. Is that your understanding? I have to get back to you on that one. Sorry, okay. Brian, I don't. Sorry, I've not yet reviewed just that. Just on that Hall's Reef, Little Hall's Reef is um, 
There's one of them. Vision. Yeah, yeah. But Jew shop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying this is what they said is most answer they yeah. take. I'll have to clarify with Reef Check yep. and get back to you on that. I know Jude Shoal is a popular recreation in both yep. areas yep. for sure. Yep. Yep. I'm yep. Okay. Yep. And that's what I, I I just want to make sure that there's been enough thought put into what's being funded mm. as because it's both building on the baseline but it's also establishing the criteria that we'll have to use for and making sure you know things like level of algal growth and bleaching yeah. and you know whether it's good <coughs> enough to determine whether this is linked to climate change impacts and it's or is more likely to result from land-based um pollution. Fuel source pollution yeah. okay. um, that's a good question thank you brian i'll, I'll take that on board other questions tom um, can you tell me about the citizen science aspect of the program yeah so this is where they specialize really is that um the methodology that they use is extremely rigorous so they ask for volunteers anyone who enjoys recreational diving um, to come on board and, and undergo a stringent training process um, over four weeks to teach them the methodology of surveying the reefs. Um, and they then take them into the field and ensure they do five to six surveys within a level of accuracy of how, how much a qualified surveyor would be getting um, in terms of their survey. And, um, on you know things from reef compos composition to fish abundance. Um, and then and then they give them the qualification to to, pro pro to progress and to continue surveying and so it's really it's led by volunteers from the community and anyone who's a recreational diver can join and be certified to be a reef check surveyor and go on these surveys um, to monitor the health of our reefs um, and the methodology has been peer reviewed um, and it is used by CSIRO and Australia Institute of Marine Science as one of the only citizen science data collection programs that they use to indicate the, the health of their reefs. That's my understanding. And do they have a problem getting volunteers? Do they, or, yeah? That's a good question. I think, um, I think they do, yes. I think sometimes they, bless you. I think they do, but not to the point where it affects the ability for them to execute the works because they still have um, a certain amount of staff um, that are based on the Sunshine Coast that can undertake the surveys if needed. Um, that's my understanding at least. But I, I, I think that they every year they run trainings for surveyors and for ambassadors, um, and but the surveyor training always seems to be quite well attended. Um, but yeah, in terms of getting them out into the field actually on making sure it aligns with the tides and the days that people are available is always a challenge with citizen science data collection programs. I, I fancy myself as a potential volunteer, but I think I'm greatly exaggerating my ability. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be a welcome addition, Tom. <laughs> Someone care to move yeah, no, on? I have two questions, thank you. Yeah. Um, Firstly, yeah, thank you for the report. It was good. I like the idea that it's, um, you know, targeting our themes for climate change we want to head, so that's great. The other thing that I really want to commend is um, that there's going to be further community uh, or consultation mm -hmm. with community services and infrastructure services department. I love the idea we're breaking mm -hmm. down those silos and mm -hmm. there's going to be, um, you know, internal collaboration. It's really exciting as we, you know, move towards a culture where, you know, it's inclusive, respectful, and, um, you know, we work together for these outcomes. I just want to raise a question around the comments made. There's risk associated with not having the, the supplier identified from the um, specialised list that does in fact reduce council's risk of breaching regulations. How have we mitigated the risk? Mm, good question yeah. again. Um, so engaging Reef Check Australia, they, it looks like they weren't on our supplier list. It has been noticed as a risk. That they're not on our suppliers okay. list. Yeah, I think I'll take that one on yeah, notice yeah, if that's yeah. all right, Councillor Pinsel. Actually, Dave. Um, uh, well, I'd probably make the comment previously, Reef Check have been funded out of the environment grants. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, we have worked is, with them before. This is the first time it's been a big for service arrangement, Councillor. Okay. And then, so through the CEO, then how do we address that? Do they get put on this preferred provider list moving forward, or are you happy for them to remain where they sit? Through, through the chair, Councillor Pinsel. Um, 
the most appropriate procurement um, will go through the environment team with advice from corporate services um, uh, at this stage. If it's funded the way it has been traditionally funded, um, more, more than happy with that. However, if there is a more full requirement mm -hmm. for procurement, we'll have our procurement advisors provide that advice to the department. Fantastic, I appreciate that. We want to mitigate risk as, as much as we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Council. Uh, Amelia. Um, Hi, Cheyenne. Hi. Uh, question. Um, so, one every two years, um, this survey is going to be conducted. Great. Um, as everyone knows, I so support, um, you know, that we start identifying our oceans and waterways as one of our, you know, priority um, natural assets. Mm -hmm. um, my question is that there's a lot of local knowledge. We've got um, local fishermen, and surfers who probably know those reefs better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great to collate that information or get them involved in any reef check type um, monitoring. I'm certain that they'll be able to um, add a lot of value. I agree. I think they definitely will. I know that reef check integrates well with the surfing community, um, hosting number of events at the J um, with Surf Rider mm -hmm. Foundation, Fantastic. but in terms of local fishermen, I will let them know, definitely. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell? I'll move the recommendation. I'll second Councillor Jerusalem. I do so. Um, Stockwell? Well, I still have some queries about how we're going to uh, ensure that the what they measure and monitor is, is uh, the best value for us and whether we do augment it. Um, I note that the recommendation is only to include them on the Council's specialised supplier list. Um, like uh, our officer, I've had something to do with Reef Check before in 2009 when the community uh, was trying to get the Labor government to honour its pledge to do a marine conservation plan on the coast of Sunshine Coast as its next priority. Uh, the Noosa Re Residents and Ratepayers, um, the President organised a forum of on around marine conservation, Eco Check. Um, Reef Check was one of the first um, people to get involved with that. We then started the Sunshine Coast Marine Conservation Alliance mm. and what might be worth uh, working out whether their 2010-2011 surveys were individual or whether it was part of a project that actually got ran uh, auspice through NICA. So NICA actually got some philanthropic funding uh, to do a survey of reefs all along the Sunshine Coast. Um, Catherine Chung from memory was the project officer in NICA. Her husband was an internationally recognised coral ecologist. We also got fish biologist from JCU. Josh Jensen uh, did a video of it. So there's quite a lot of data there, um, which also would help us if we're trying to compare our shire with uh, other reefs in similar locations. But as you say, the, the reef tech methodology and the fact that they do train and upgrade uh, divers to become uh, 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 fully fled, uh, fully au fait with their process means that it, it, it both is a capacity building but also a useful tool to gauge impacts. What I would hope we can do in terms of looking at this uh, criteria as one of the criteria we're measuring performance of our whole environment strategy against is ensure that all the criteria that we do capture feed into answering the sort of impacts that we'd like to assess, i.e. whether it's land based, whether it's broader climate based, whether there's a mix of both, um, whether it's um, uh, you know, like in the, the reef uh, survey I talked about on the Sunshine Coast, one of the biggest things there was the, uh, not the diversity of fish, but the abundance of fish. Um, they identified that the species that were most absent were those fish that both the commercial and recreational fish had target. Mm -hmm. um, very, one snapper being one of them, very shortly after then there was a closed season mm -hmm. um, announced on snapper. So they're the sort of things we have to think about, is how do we combine all the different data sources to provide us with good information about how well our environment strategies and actions are, are doing in terms of achieving the desired outcome. Good point. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Okay. Put the motion as in favour. <coughs> that is carried unanimously. Thank you very Thank much, Councillor. Thank, Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you. Have a nice day. Next item, item six is Mersin North Shore Aircraft okay. Landing Ground Reserve request to relinquish Council trusteeship. Uh, we've got um, Clint 
Um, excuse me, yes. I have a conflict. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Oh, thank you. Um, I, Councillor okay. Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter. As Mr. David Cookman, Vice President of Sunshine Coast Aviators, I'm not sure if he still is the Vice President, but anyway, who has submitted to this issue don donated $500 on the 17th of March 2020 to my 2020 election campaign and also put up core flutes for me during this campaign. Mr. Cookman receives a small financial benefit for the club's use of the fields in his capacity one of their, as one of their part, paid part-time trainers for club members. As a result of my conflict of interest, I'll now leave the meeting room while this matter is considered and voted on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Councillor Lawrence. I, Councillor Lawrence, informed the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to David Cookman, Vice President of Sunshine Coast Sports Aviators, submitted set of Sunshine Coast Sports Aviators. Submitters to this report. Mr. Cookman approached me after a meet the candidates night and asked for some election campaign posters to advertise on his properties. I did not know Mr. Cookman or have any relationship with him prior to the meeting, meeting him that night. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable, per reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I do not consider that I have a close personal relationship with Mr. Cookman, and I believe Mr. Cookman does not stand to receive a personal benefit or loss in relation to this matter. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Um, Look, I, I have a, a question for the CEO. Yeah. The Mayor's declaration makes it clear that Mr. Cookman does stand yeah, it's it's a one complex. way or the other. I'm wondering if Councillor Lawrence would be prepared to amend I that agree. aspect of this is the declaration. Old, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So can I um, request that we admit... And I believe Mr. Cookman does not yeah. stand. I yes. believe that Mr. Cookman does not... No. No, no. 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 Just delete And I believe Mr. Cookman does not stand. Oh, I'm saying that there's some general loss in relation to this matter. That could be admitted, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to move so, that um, the council note the declarable conflict of interest by Councillor Lawrence and, and determine that it is in the public interest that Councillor Lawrence participates and votes on this matter because council believes that Councillor Lawrence does not have a close personal relationship with Mr. Cookman and that Mr. Cookman's And that Mr. Cookman's activities during the election are consistent with general, general participation in local dem democracy. And, and the value the value, oh sorry, not and, just the value of which, the value of which is less than the statutory benchmark of $500. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. <coughs> we have a second of that, please. Second, second to Councillor Wigner. Councillor Stockley, speak. I do so. If all Mr. Cookman did was to ask for some election material and put up a board, and there's been no donation, there's been no, it's a, you know, if you charge a, a volunteers at $25 an hour, it probably took him five minutes to put up the, uh, put up the sign. Um, it's just part of democracy. It shouldn't be something that excludes uh, a councillor from participating in participation in a subsequent event or, or vote. Councillor Tuesday. Councillor Tuesday. I've got a question for the CEO. Yes. Um, Councillor Lawrence, 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 Councillor a, an executive position on the Sunshine Coast Sports Aviators, and as a result, um, 
wouldn't require, would, just as an ordinary member wouldn't require that, but also Councillor Stewart has highlighted something that I uh, had not considered before in his capacity as a part-time trainer that there may be some financial benefit. I wouldn't. Um, I now believe I may have to also make a declaration in that regard because some, some new information has come to light yes. uh, with regard to uh, his position. Okay, Councillor Stewart, thank you for that. And we'll deal with um, Councillor Lawrence's... Oh, sorry, we haven't dealt with that yet. My apologies. Well, in fact, yeah. and so that may, would mean that, may, that may mean I have to be precluded from voting on yep. the matter. That's why okay. I raise it. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. All right. Um, uh, will anyone else wish to speak to Councillor Stockwell's motion about Councillor Lawrence? Put, put it to the vote. Those in favour? That is Councillor Finzel, Wagner, Stockwell, and Wilkie. Note that Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Jurisdic did not vote on the matter. And Councillor Jurist, you wish to make a statement? Yes. Uh, similar to the mayor's? No, so, um, uh, no not similar to the mayor's, because he, uh, he wasn't a donator to my campaign, but he did uh, represent me, I believe, and I've looked through my records and I can't, I can't find um, evidence of it, but my recollection is that he did represent me at the Pomona booth during the 2016 campaign. Um, there was no handing out of election material, but he stood there with my campaign paraphernalia on. Um, so I'll have to make a declaration similar to um, uh, Councillor Lawrenson's, but also include the Mayor's point about that uh, honour. Can I just go back to what the declaration by Councillor Lawrenson was? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, said I, Councillor Jurisdic, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to David Cookman, Vice President. Well, uh, if he's the Vice President, uh, I'll say Vice President, such like case sports area, as submitted to this report. Mr. Cookman assisted with my 2016 campaign in um, as a uh, as my representative at the Pomona booth, Pomona booth, uh, uh, although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe the reasonable person, well, I don't know, was, how did you have election period? No, I think I'll do what uh, Councillor um, Stewart has said. I, as a result of this, I'll leave the meeting. No, I'll put it. I'll put it to the council. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I don't believe a reasonable person could have perception of bias because I don't put, to consider that I have a close personal relationship with Mr. Cookman. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I respect the decision of the meeting whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Are you going to mention Mr. Cookman's potential benefit? Um, Mr. Well, the mayor, the mayor has that up there. You can add the second last sentence from the mayor's. Yeah. Actually, given given what the mayor has stated there, I think I'll follow the mayor's the mayor's line. Um, that Mr. Cookman receives a small financial benefit, and I will leave the meeting. It is my understanding that Mr. Cookman may receive a small financial benefit from me. It is now my understanding, yes. May receive. May receive a small financial benefit. Okay.
first. And Clint, could you give us an overview? Welcome. Uh, could you give us an overview of the report and the request that we're considering here today, please? Yes, happy to. Um, the Department of Resources wrote to us some time ago now about um, the Department of Environment and Science was wishing, wishing to acquire the landing ground reserve into ultimately into to National Park. Um, and the request really relates to um, requesting council basically if they are open to uh, relinquishing trusteeship of the reserve to allow uh, DES to become, a, that's the Department of Environment and Science, to become the trustee of the reserve, so ultimately transition to National Park. Um, there's been a number of documents provided um, with the report. Probably the important ones are the legal advice provided by King and Co. Um, and the Department of Environment and Sciences Summary of Natural Values and Risk Report um, to support their request. Um, we did go out to the, both the groups out there, which is the Sunshine Coast Sports Aviators and the Noosa Model Flyers, um, to advise them of the proposal to transfer the trusteeship. Um, both of those groups are in favour of the status quo remaining, that is council staying as the, as the trustee. Um, and it's noted in the, in the executive summary there, based on the uh, unfamiliarity, if you like, with the Department of Environment and Science and concerns over the future use of the reserve. Um, the report, though, looks at a couple of options in terms of um, not supporting the state government request uh, and also supporting the request. Um, and it's the latter that this report um, uh, seeks to follow. Uh, and, and the reasons for that is the overall um, better land management outcomes of, of the land transferring to trusteeship with the state. Um, but notwithstanding <coughs> that, there's also an important part of the report too where the, the state has advised it will undertake consultation on future use of the reserve if the if council um, votes to, for the trusteeship to transfer. Um, and that's an important part of, res of the report. So. Uh, it's recommended that council follow uh, option two in the report and also uh, provide the feedback provided by all groups, which includes the, the groups I mentioned and also McDermott Aviation. I'm happy to leave that. Thank you, Councillor Finzel. We have a seconder, please. A seconder. A seconder, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Finzel, I'm just to speak on the motion. Uh, yeah, I just think that, yes, we'll make a formal request from the Department of Resources regarding the Department of Environment and Science's desire to form a required Thank you, Councillor You're welcome. Councillors wish to speak to me. Councillor did have a question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the regulation, like, the, 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 the with the planes taking off and the, um, the SOFA, that the landing strip there, do they deal with state regulations more with that, or council regulations? Because I would suspect it'd be states concerning fuel, air, airplanes, all the different regulations concerning aircraft. Oh, well, the, the management of the land comes under the Land Act and the associated conditions under the lease. Um, there may be some crossover into the CASA type regulation there in terms of the above the ground and the flight, but the council's prim primary uh, responsibility is about the land and what happens on the land. So I couldn't, I couldn't uh, answer that question fully, councillor, in terms of what happens in the air. But my understanding is CASA. Yeah, the, the reason I bring that up is um, they say that they're not familiar with uh, DES or state regulations, where they may well be in, in constant um, compliance with other state regulations concerning flying and safety and things. Yeah, through the chair, councillor. That's primarily <coughs> a comment in there. I, I suspect from the group is primarily about the tenure-related yeah, matters. Right, right, yeah. I'm, I'm going to move in an. Yes. I'm going to move an amendment. Yep. And it's a long one, so um, my five minutes doesn't start till I finish the motion. So it's to um, keep item A as per the recommendation, but be more specific in item B. And I'll read that out. Uh, Authorise the CEO to write to the Department of Resources advising that Council 1 has evaluated this property consistent with the requirements of Section 16 of the Land Act 1994 as part of its recent planning scheme review. 
As a result of this evaluation, Council has zoned the property for environmental management and conservation. It is noted that A, the overall desired outcomes for this zone include land identified as ecologically important areas, water catchments, beach protection or coastal management areas or natural areas with historical cultural very values are protected from development. Two, development avoids and mitigates against adverse impacts of the values and processes within ecologically important areas. Three, where a demonstrated community need exists, low-scale, low-impact structures with a small building footprint such as viewing decks, shelters and environmental facilities that provide for appreciation, conservation, interpretation of ecologically important areas or areas of cultural heritage value may develop will be consistent with the management intent of the, or plan for the area. For low impact, impact outdoor sport and recreation activities such as walking trails, canoe trails and the like may develop where a demonstrated community need exists and such activities do not adversely affect the ecological values of the area. If you could scroll down please, Alinda. Oh, you're not scrolling down on that screen for some reason. Okay, five, low impact telecommunication facilities and utility installations occur only where they cannot locate in other appropriate zone or compatible with and do not impact on the values of processes when they're ecological important areas and are designed to minimise the visual impacts on the scenic amenity of the area. Six, buildings and structures are designed to maximise energy efficiency and water conservation. Seven, activities undertaken by recognised traditional owners in accordance with traditional owner custom and practice may be considered. And eight, Development responds to land constraints, including topography, bushfire and flooding. B, if you could scroll up again, please. Let's scroll down. This one, this one's oh. In the light of this evaluation, Council adopted a position in Section 3.36, Transport and Movement of the Strategic Framework of the Noosa Plan, wherein it states that the Use of the North Shore airstrip will not be expanded and the airstrip will be ultimately closed. Two, that Council A has already adopted the position that the highest and best use of the site is for conservation and B considers the most efficient and effective management and protection regime to achieve the outcome, outcomes desired by the Noosa Plan 2020 is to add the lot to the broader conservation estate. C therefore supports the relinquishment of its trusteeship of Lot 7 on MCH 4562 to allow the Department of Environment and Science to be appointed as a new trustee, providing all remnant vegetation, wetlands, fauna habitats and areas of cultural significance are added to the adjacent National Park or protected under a similar tenure. The rest of the recommendation of the motion is as is the, rec the current motion. We have a second for that, please. I'll, I'll second the amendment. I do so. Um, staff suggested their, re their recommendation was consistent with support, although it didn't say support. Um, over the weekend, I reflected on what the decision in front of us was, and I had to reflect back 20 years ago to when I was actually a, um, both a senior then principal state land planner. And I reflected on what the Land Act actually requires us, requires, what will require the, the department to do to make a decision. Um, we've been asked for our views on a change of tenure or, or of trustee which will lead to a change of tenure most likely under the Land Act. The Land Act is quite different to a number of acts in that it really specifies a couple of key things. It says um, the land, the following principles apply sustainability, sustainable resource use and development to ensure existing needs are met and the state resources are conserved for the benefit of future generations. It does overtly say that your decision should be uh, intergenerational. You should be thinking the long term. It also talks about in the object of the Act that evaluation is based on appraisal of land capability and consideration and balancing of different economic, environmental, cultural and social opportunities and values of the land. And finally, in under, under protection, that protection of environmentally and cultural valuable and sensitive areas and features. Now there is no question that the vast majority of this property has exceptional environmental, culturally valuable and sensitive areas. The information supplied to its attachments clearly shows a range of, of habitats, of fauna, of values. I think, and I haven't double checked it, that the, looking at the overheads, that it's probably the most southern extent of a pattern fen in the world. 
No one knew they existed in the Southern Hemisphere until we had the Ramsar Convention here in the 90s, I think. But it's important also to say, well, you know, what should we, what would the department have to evaluate? <coughs> and it, in Section 16, which I referred to, it talks about before land is allocated under this Act, and while it might be allocating it in temporary to a different uh, reserve status, or it might be just changing the, the, the um, who is the trustee, they must assess the most appropriate tenure and use for the land. And we did that in the planning scheme. So when it conducts the evaluation, the Chief Executive of the Department of Resources takes into account of state, regional and local planning strategies and policies and the object of this Act. That's why I detailed what our local planning plan said, is because they must take that into consideration when they make their decision. And it's clear from that what that decision uh, supports the change in trustees. Um, and it also says, B, take account of commitments of and undertakings given by the state in relation to the land. And it's really clear under the Great Sandy Management Plan for decades now, there's been commitment to add this to the National Park. And this council's always supported that part of the Great Sandy Management Plan. What I do want to say is that my recommendation is really specific about what we think is clear, and that is about the remnant vegetation wetlands. It is still suggest not saying anything about the areas that don't have those values, and that re goes back for the department to make a decision in terms of uh, the, the other parts of this motion. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Any questions? Question. Question, Councillor The very bottom of uh, the amendment, the very last sentence, um, therefore relinquishes the trusteeship of Lot 7, um, the number, to allow the Department of Environment and Science to be appointed as the new trustee, providing all remnant vegetation wetland on habitat. Also, significance are added to the adjacent national park or protected under similar tenure. When it says so long, okay, sorry. Okay, I thought I thought it said so long as there, there's kind of a condition there, but it's not. I just I misread that. My apologies. Just uh, uh, my question is: um, the amendment came late last night. In fact, I read it this morning. I would love in between now and Thursday's meeting to understand from council officers and the CEO um, whether um, it is supported and the intent and interpretation is correct. Um, I just need that information before I make a decision on this amendment. To further, through the chair to further ordinary is what you're asking? Um, council officers? Yes, just to get some um, context and an understanding that again um, the interpretation is correct. Council officers wouldn't oppose that if it's the wooden table? Well, can I ask, um, well, we've got some council officers here. Has, has um, what you've, you've read in the amendment there, is that consistent with council council's understanding of, of uh, the uses of the land? Is there anything in that amendment that is incorrect or inconsistent? Yeah. I, might, I might defer to Dennis or Dave on this one. Uh, mm. to, to, Dave, to the chair, I'll talk about the environmental things the council has, has articulated, which is spot on, basically 100%. Okay. It is. Yeah. I'll well, just add one thing that probably wasn't articulated before, but a lot of those particular systems contain peat as a substrate. Uh, peat is really, really significant in a global sense. It locks up, even though it's only 5% of the world's surface area, it locks up 30% of the carbon, soil-based carbon. So in terms of really protecting those areas from like fire events we had in Friesian in 2019, which burned through peat and liberated a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, so that's, a, that's a thing that hasn't really been mentioned to date with any of the attachments that we only found out about about a month ago. So just the importance of those ecosystems. So them. just to clarify, it's spot on in terms of its accuracy. Correct. Okay. Um, so we also have Dennis. Dennis um, to yeah, through the chair, I might just ask a question of Brian, um, similar to, to Tom's query. Just that word, providing, mm. it, do, do, what do you mean by that? Is, is that in that it would facilitate or you I'm suggesting we're handing it over in the expectation that it gets a protected conservation estate, whether it's a national park or a conservation reserve under the land act. Because the only thing we would say is that, um, you know, we don't have a 
a statutory role, so we're oh, not okay. providing a so, conditional. Um, on the understanding, I'm happy to change that if that's. Um, under, on the understanding, it would facilitate. Yes. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Acknowledging or something. Yeah. So I'm happy to, if the room's happy, on to insert the words providing necessity on the understanding that. Yeah. yeah. That the purpose is understanding that the purpose of this transfer is. Or, hmm. or, or that it could facilitate. Oh, that it could. Okay. The, that it that should. So okay, no, I think that that's how I'll go. New trustee on the understanding that this should facilitate. There, there you go. We're not we're not setting conditions in that way. Yeah, I see what no. council. Yeah. That was my question. No matter what we hope for the future of the land, it's the state's. <coughs> yeah, it's not conditional. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. We're not in a position to demand conditions. Yeah, yeah, thank that. Councillor Finzo, you have a question? Yeah, well, I want to go down the same road because um, I want some feedback on this because I don't think it aligns with what um, the initial recommendation was. Um, I want to be absolutely certain that this is not conditional uh, because, in my opinion, I think that negates C and D, which um, requests the Department of Science to engage with the consultation with the community. Um, when we say we're supporting the relinquishment in the understanding that should facilitate the environmental things. Um, so yeah, I'd like to move this forward to bring that back with some clarification and I'm not comfortable with that wording as it stands. Okay, so you're against the amendment? I'm against it, yeah. Okay. Any other people wish to speak to the council wish to speak to the amendment? I'll put it to the vote. Yep, call well, the yeah. Just digest it. It's a big amendment. I'm just digest. Yeah, I think it's too, it's too much. Too much. Really late. It's yeah. Because again, what you said, then I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it, it takes time to to, to, to go down. It, it's yeah, it's I think what you just said. Yeah. If this gets conditioned, it is to authorise the CEO to meet the this in correspondence. I don't see that come with the recommendation from the staff. Um, it could not quite align with where we want to go. Um, I just want to make sure, given the short amount of time frame and it is an extensive amendment, I don't even know where Councillor Stockwell has drawn this information from. Um, I would just feel more comfortable if we had more time to address this. Yeah. And if this amendment is passed today, um, mm. Mr. CEO, uh, uh, and it becomes part of the motion which is passed, um, mm. councillors have the opportunity between now and Thursday to get further information from staff. Absolutely. And satisfy themselves that, as we've been advised, that it consists entirely of the thinking that's justified this, this meeting in the first place. Chair, absolutely, there is that ability. The final decision is not made until we've already had a meeting. Thank you. All right, any other councillors to speak to the motion? Do you come in? No, I, um, yeah, um, I, I would like to just digest it, but to, 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 to the, um, on there. Does that, does that make sense? Do you want to read it, move a procedural motion, or are you? Well, this is, we can, we can, if you're not comfortable with the, the amendment, it can be, be lost now. You can vote against it. We go back to the, to, uh, the original motion, moved by Councillor Pinzel, and then, between now and, and Thursday night, you can go and see staff about the content of Councillor Stockwell's amendment. Yeah, what, what, what you said, it, it triggered me. It just said, look, I, I, want, I want to read it now while we do it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I don't know where all this information's come from. I haven't had time to drill down on that. So I think, yeah. Okay, perhaps um, I'll, I'll ask staff. Staff, where does this, um, uh, these, these, um, clauses in this amendment come from? Are they drawn from council documents and, and uh, strategies? Through the chair, the environmental aspects that the councillor mentions is mostly the attachments with the report in terms of enunciating the environmental values. 
So it's kind of already there. It's already in the report? Yeah. So the planning scheme zoning probably didn't, wasn't in the report, I don't know. So, I'll, I'll give it to a cabinet. I'll, I'll move the matter be referred to, to ordinary meeting. Okay. Because we've had three councillors who say they want to get their head around it. I'm, I'm not going to push it. Um, okay. They do have to be satisfied that what I'm saying uh, is consistent with what's in the planning scheme. There was. So, you're moving to receive a motion? Yeah. Okay. I'll second it. Councillor Stockwell's moving to receive a motion and make it to the ordinary meeting. Yeah. Do we need to give a reason, Mr. CEO? Just further information, Councillor Stafford. Further information. Councillor Wigger, any discussion about or questions about the procedural motion, Councillor Pinzel? Well, yeah, I, I just think that you know, I don't, want, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that we are not restricting the response back from the CEO or limited in any way through, you know, actually locking them in without. In enacting what would be a future resolution of council, those points have been added <coughs> that would be part of their correspondence that we would provide um, to the state government for their consideration. Okay, I'll put the procedural motion to vote. All those in favour? That is to refer it to the general, the ordinary meeting on Thursday night, and that is unanimous. Thank you, staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We come now to the last item on the agenda, which is the financial performance report. They can have it Mayor Stewart and uh, um, Councillor Jerusalem back in the room. The financial performance report up to November, page 55. Welcome, Pauline. Welcome, Trent. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, financial performance for November continues to be strong with operating revenues continuing to outperform out, out forecast with operating expenditures slightly under forecast year to date. Operating revenues are $2.7 million above budget and this is comprised of $405,000 from general rates and waste and utility charges, uh, $297,000 from fees and uh, charges, $1.1 million from interest revenue, uh, 591,000 from sales of goods and services and 412,000 from operating grant revenue. Operating expenditures $120,000 over budget with materials and services 714,000 over budget um, with the majority of it relating to civil operations. <clears throat> this has been offset marginally by lower than budgeted employee costs of 496,000. Tourism and economic development expenditure remains on track year to date. And overall, council's operating position at the end of November is $2.6 million above budget. <coughs> Capital revenue is above budget by $11 million, and this is due to the advanced payment of the Curie disaster funding for Black Mountain. Um, and capital expenditure is $5.9 million behind budget due to the timing of project delivery around the landfill, um, the Heads Dogs Beach, the Trail 5 upgrade and Beckman Road intersection. Council's current cash holding at the end of November was $104 million, with $60 million of these funds currently invested in higher yield return deposits to maximise returns to ratepayers. As per Council's request at the previous committee meeting, the December quarter financial report will include an analysis of this cash holding and also a deep dive into short stay and transitory rating. Any questions? Did you say last bit again? Uh, I was actually absent, but apparently there was a request for a deep dive into short stay and transitory rating. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that will come through. It will come through in the December report because I've been on leave. Thank you. Yeah. Questions of staff? Um, you mentioned the figure was prepaid. Was it a sizable one? The QRA one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was $11, 11. million dollars, um, that was prepaid in relation to Black Mountain. In terms of the contractual agreement around that sort of early payment, 
is there a requirement for any interest to be accrued to go to that project? Uh, no, there's no there's no requirement under the agreement for grant funding that the funds that are earned on the investment of those funds goes back towards that project. They just become part of council's general fund. Mm. Certainly, it's something that I think we should look at in terms of these, particularly a large one like that. That, to me, ethically, it would be good to have some way of saying, well, we've got 11 million for this much. We've earned this much interest. Let's put it in a bucket for preparing for the next disaster. Let's say that you know all these sort of things that we weren't expend expecting to get in this budget, how do we actually use that to create a fund that we can stop start doing in our own way of reducing the potential future impact of the next disaster? Yeah. So it's just one thing to think about. Yeah. Through, through, through the chair, I can, I can probably assist with that. Council currently does have a reserves and restricted cash policy, so one of the things we can do is to review that to consider how we deal with interest associated with those funds held in reserve and restricted cash. Um, and um, clearly, with this interest, we've got a, we've got a prepayment here of QRA for disaster funds. Um, we also earlier in the year had a uh, prepayment for the waste levy subsidy that's unwinding over the next five years. Um, we can do a bit of work between now and um, in the financial year as we adopt that to understand what is the best use of funds if those interest is earned because obviously if we have project variations uh, in costs that aren't funded by QRA even though the initial scope might be funded we want to make sure we've got that could be a sufficient funding source for that and, and the same with obviously funds for waste so I'm happy to take that on notice if that's the case. Thank you. Just, just, just. Yeah, so along the lines of what Council Sockwell is suggesting there we know that we're having price blowouts on, on the list. We know that not everything that we have uh, encountered is covered under the funding opportunity. So, um, yeah, my, uh, along the lines of what Brian, Brian's suggesting there, my first uh, consideration for um, the interest would be to cover the shortfall of funds in, in those areas. And the waste, the waste example that you've given, uh, perhaps... Um, to other waste initiatives or, or, or because we are going to be progressing forward with, um, with changes in the waste community. So is that an opportunity that we can look at with regard to knowing what the interest is on those, knowing what the expenditure is on those elements and whether that's a priority that we can, we can do with when, when the uh, budget considerations come forward? Sure, through the chair, definitely. Um, it's, it, it, it helps um, piece of what we bring through with the December round of reports about breaking down what our cash is comprised <coughs> of to give you a quarterly update on that is a, a foundational piece of work that will help us break down that, that interest revenue into different components. Um, and your point about um, items of work that are unfunded through disaster, disaster recovery is a very valid one because with our recent claim we did have an element of work to $200,000 that was not that was not considered eligible under funding, so this would be the interest that would that would cover that in, the, in this case. Thank you, Trent. We've seen 10, 10 um, interest rate rises in a row. I think the Reserve Bank is unprecedented. I guess coming into next year into the budget, um, I ask it every month. Any concerns? Um, finishing the, off the year, um, are we in a good position going to budget discussions for next year? Yeah, so in terms of where we're heading for the rest of the remaining of the year, we're on track to achieve budget or be, yep. do better at this stage uh, okay. with the quarantine of unforeseen circumstances. Um, in terms of CPI and increases, we're eagerly looking forward to yeah. December CPI. Yeah. Um, that will help inform the increases for salaries um, for staff as well as they're tied to CPI. Okay. Um, we anticipate that could be 8%. Our budget currently yeah. increased provision to 5%. So there could be so we'll make a further impact. Four, three percent. So and that could be several hundred thousand worth of dollars okay. to that. Yeah, I suppose that to add to that through the chair, <coughs> it's important to remember that a lot of the goods and services that we procure as a council are very different to what is the mix for CPI. Remembering that CPI is about average household spend. It includes groceries and, and food, <coughs> um, standard insurances. Um, our mix of expenditures and as an organisation is very different. We're procuring large amounts of asphalt, gravel, concrete, uh, consultancy services. 
So um, often you'll find that the price index on those is significantly higher than what would be your otherwise average CPI for the, for the state. So this is one of the pressures that we'll work through through the budget deliberations for the next one, next one year is that whilst we might be um, facing nationally a 7 or an 8% CPI, um, some of the cost pressures that we see internally in our contracts uh, are, are face, face different pressures and diesel is a great example of that, for example, or electricity sure. price rises. Okay, thank you. I have a question. I, I might not have noticed it before, but you've got a, a sentence that says tourism and economic development activities funded through the general rate, the 5.8% of the annual general rate committed towards tourism and economic development. Forgive me, I haven't noticed that in there before. Um, what, is, what is the 5.8% of the general annual general rate actually translation in dollar terms? Uh, off the top of my head, I'd have to calculate it for you, yeah, but it, 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 I can take it on notice. But it stemmed from when the tourism economic levy became, ceased to be a separate levy and went into general rates to ensure that we maintain yeah. the same level of funding. And that's all but I can come back to that Yes, correct. Okay, at 5.8%? Yeah. For this financial year, yeah. obviously, with each yeah, year, very each year, next year, as we go through budget deliberations, that mix may change, yeah. but it's also about. Um, funding mix as we invest in new initiatives and other programs. Yeah. So on page 66, Statement of Income and Expenditure, it's got rates, levies and charges for the year 82,499. The annual general rates are less than that. Is Correct. It? So it's That's 60 million. 60 million. Yeah. That's right. Right. 60 yeah. Yeah. But I can, I can provide that information. That isn't the information in the table? Isn't it? The, if you're saying that at 5.8 percent allocated, then the annual budget is 3.85. Oh, in terms of the tourism and economic development levy, yes. Yeah. There are several low cost centres that don't get included, okay. relating to digital hub as well. What do you get 3.85? Um, um, the table above, payment tourism USA and the economic development total 3.85. Mm. If you put the two together. Yeah. So that includes um, staff, staff time projects and the grants. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to move it, Mr Chair. Move Councillor Stewart, second Councillor Larson, Ms Stewart. Uh, thank you again, once again. I say that every month, but there's a huge amount of work that goes into these reports and coming into the end of the year, I appreciate, you know, there has been a lot of trials and tribulations with rising costs and, and um, concerns over, you know, staff shortages, labour. So you guys are at the, the really at the grassroots of that. So we appreciate all the hard work you do. Uh, and, and unprecedented, as I said, 10 times in a row, um, interest rate rises and record inflation. These really are uh, across the board, uh, unprecedented times financially. So I want to thank you both for steadying the ship and, and our CEO, um, because you guys do a great job and we're really appreciative of it. And uh, you enable us to be able to make sound decisions. Um, so thank you. Yeah, it's Always really useful to have this month on month. Um, always really impressive how the new accountant's getting so much better interest rate. <laughs> but having said that, now's the easy time. How well we set the next budget is going to be critical because the modelling I, I've heard is that they're expecting the peak to occur around about June next year. That's going to be the peak of the impact of the rate rises. If they achieve that, then the rates will either stationary or whatever. I reckon the most important report you've got to produce that's on budget is February 2024. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. Good timing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion, Councillor Warren? Um, I just want to note um, that the reports get better and better and really appreciate the transparency and openness and our and your commitment and council's commitment to the community that um, you know we're held to be accountable and um, thank you for the report look forward to the deep dive in short-term accommodation thank you yeah I just want to reiterate that uh, that, that question that uh, the comp with regard to um, being able to understand that element of, uh, uh, of um, interest or additional interest that's uh, being garnered by that, uh, those prepayments for waste and for uh, disaster management being 
uh, insulated in a sense, so that uh, when it comes to budget deliberations next year and in future years, we understand that that's um, not something that's there every year and that we don't uh, become used to it, that we understand that this is a, um, a one-off parcel <coughs> of, of interest and, um, and financial management that, uh, uh, that is outside the realms of uh, the normal, normal nature of council business, and just so that we're clear uh, in our understanding of what we can, you know, what, how it's come about, and, uh, and our, um, uh, I guess, our understanding for future budgets. Thank you. Question um, on page 59 of the materials is slightly more than, um, than, the, than, the, than the budget, the budget is. Are we are they leveling out now? Through through COVID, we had this incredible spike on materials and costs and panic buying and, and hard to get here. Is that is that leveling out now, or is it is it just continuing to get more and more difficult to get this material? Uh, are you in talking in supply chain or? Yeah, supply chain and in general, um, in um, um, you know the bridges, the making things. Um, in well, we still have supply chain chain issues. However, they are tending to improve. They are on the improve. Um, however, we also have CPI and inflationary pressures, so the cost of escalations are increasing. So that's why it's part of the capital work program that we look at that um, quite closely to monitor the variations on capital projects and manage scope creep and those sorts of things. So that if there are fluctuations, we can manage delivery of programs or identify projects that can be delayed if necessary. Yeah, I think scope creep, I, I worry about that. But, they, but we've always said that you actually can't keep pushing back projects in order to not break the budget. No, you can't, you can't push back um, core infrastructure projects that are needed, but you can sort of, I suppose, reprioritise those that are less um, needed at the time. And hopefully we don't need to do that. We can't, we, at this stage, we aren't uh, delaying projects. De project <coughs> delays are usually around um, increased work or things that have been discovered on the project or um, procurement of, of supplies and contract services. So um, at this stage, there's a couple of projects that have been delayed, but they should be completed in the next 12 months. <coughs> um, yeah, look, I'd also like to thank you for the transparent and extensive financial reporting. It was much appreciated. So ever since the Council Councillors de Amalgamated, there's been the minority voices of all of the Council Councillors struggling financially, uh, bankrupt, which is totally untruthful. And anyone who's been interested enough to check the validity of those claims only needs to look at one of those monthly financial reports to understand yeah. the truth of those. Statements. Yeah. Um, so, thank you for your service. Motion, those in favour?